Astonishing Legends would like to thank Miller High Life, Sunsoil, Western Digital, Stitch Fix, Purple, our contributors at Patreon.com, and you, our listeners, for making tonight's show possible. Last week, I took you on a journey into the shallow psyches of Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Unsurprisingly, even that trip took longer than expected, so this week we're back with the second half of my show. Well, their show, but with me, Richard Haddam, interviewing them, asking them not only my questions, but yours. Tonight, we'll take things even further, touching on everything from intelligent extraterrestrial goo on the White House lawn to Rob Christofferson's encounter with a human-faced kangaroo. That's right, just when you thought things couldn't get any stranger. So, slip back into your barca lounger, settle down by the fireplace, or grab your headphones. It's time for part two of Fear and Smoking in Blanket Fortiana. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Richard Haddam, and this is Scott Philbrook. I'm now noticing that the formula we use to open the show doesn't always work. Join us tonight for the shocking conclusion of my interview with Scott and Forrest. back for way more than you bargained for. <laughs> That's the truth. Uh, thank you for joining us again to listen to us talk incessantly about ourselves. A, a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we kick off tonight's show. We've really been hearing from a lot of you lately. We just wanted to say thanks so much for writing in. Uh, we don't always have time to respond to every email, but we do read every single one of them, believe it or not, and we appreciate you sending them in. Yes, of course we do. And there's a lot of fun stuff on the horizon for the rest of this year, believe it or not some highly requested topics, and, of course, the spooky season is upon us as well. So we're gearing up for that now, or, or at least we should be gearing up for that. So keep your ears peeled. In fact, our show next week is going to be really something. It's a roundtable discussion about one of the most absolutely freaky, bizarre encounters in paranormal history, Sam the Sandown Clown. It's unreal. It's unreal. Well, I've been like, pressuring you for a I long know. time. I'm excited Ever since I read it. Rob's article on it, you just read it, and there's so much going on. One of the things I like about it is that, yeah, it's freaky, it's bizarre, it's weird, it's ineffable, it's unexplainable, but there's a sadness and a sweetness to it in a, in a way. Yes, and, and the Rob that Forrest is talking about there is uh, Rob Morphy, who will be yeah. joining us for this roundtable. Yeah, we're going to be sitting down and talking with our good friends, Micah Hanks, as well as Rob Morphy, and they're both podcasters and accomplished researchers in this realm. So yeah, that's going to be a good one next week. Oh, and before we get started tonight, we did want to give a brief shout out to our friend Jake Boss, who uh, your family loves you as well as all your plants. Yeah, man, you can thank Cassie for that one. All right, it's time to move on to question three oh. from Rich's list. <laughs> we're, yeah, no, we're only we're I think we're on five, maybe. I don't uh. know. Let, let's get back to it. I'm so sorry. So uh, where were we, Rich? Well, we had a question from Christopher Brown from Derry, New Hampshire. Um, he wants to know, oh, this is great. What unsolved topics have you covered where you feel strongly that your conclusions were close to or even completely correct? I'm guessing every single episode. <laughs> uh, especially near death. Yes, we figured out what happens to you after you die. And so I don't need to talk about it anymore. It's completely solved. You know, when I think about it, oh God, it's a good question. It's funny because you can be like pretty convinced of something personally, but afraid to take a stand on it because you don't want to be like, I said it was this. And then when the when it gets solved, you're like, <laughs> you couldn't have been more wrong. So right. The very next day, it's like, nope, here's the Bigfoot costume. Well, yeah. Speaking of that, Patterson Gimlin. I don't know what the answer is there, but I feel certain that it was not a hoax and that if it was. Bob Gimlin was not in on it. And that's because we met and hung out with Bob Gimlin. And like, when you talk to the guy, right. it's not in the cards, in my opinion. So, <laughs> well, that's just your personal perspective. Well, yeah, I mean, well, he, uh, what Christopher well, said was yeah. you feel strongly, your conclusions were close. I feel strongly right. that our conclusions about Bob are right. I can't base it on scientific principle other than, you know, I'm looking at the big picture about yeah. Patty in general. Sure, I think there's lots of Bigfoot stories that might be somebody in a costume. I just don't think that's one of them. 
and and if it was, I don't think Bob knew about it. So there's that. I will also say that when we finished the Jersey Devil series, I felt pretty sure that that was mostly started from a political beef and just uh, feuding between uh, Hmm. local politicians. And even though, Forrest, I remember you towards the end saying, yeah, but what about this siding and that siding? And I do think maybe there's something in the Pine Barrens. But I think that those are disconnected from the lore associated with the Jersey Devil for all those years and where that idea came from. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there's probably cryptids in the Pine Barrens, <laughs> but yeah. I just feel like yeah. it's that's a different thing. So that would be my answer there. The only the other one that's more complicated, I'll just say quickly, and Forrest, and I'll turn it over to you, is like, is Amelia Earhart, of course. I was about to say, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. There's go ahead. Theor- a lot of theories there about what happened to her, and at this moment, I'm behind two of them. And they can't both be. <laughs> uh, no. You can elaborate on that. But okay. ostensibly, they can't both be. I am not with the, you know, ditched at sea and sank. I am definitely not with uh, the Nicomororo, the island that they've been to 50,000 times. And every six months, they say, we found a new thing. I'm not, I don't think she was ever there. Mm-hmm. I believe that she either went to Saipan because there were like over 200 witnesses there that saw her. I think that's entirely possible. But I am also... I also have a lot of faith in Bill Snavely's finding that airplane in the water off uh, Buka. And uh, we continue to talk with him, and he's continuing to send people over there. And there's been stuff that's happened that we can't talk about on the air yet. We're under an NDA and everything for that. But there's nothing that's come up that's led me to believe that he's on the wrong track. So in that case, there's two plausible solutions to it, and I don't know that they can coexist, although Forrest has a different opinion about that that's even more far out about whether or not her plane or she could have been seen in one or two places. It's not really that far out. What it is, and there are several questions. I'm not sure if we actually answered any of them put to us previously or they're coming up. What has changed about how you look at the general view on mysteries, you know, through our experience and research and all that. And one thing I probably, I guess I always considered this, and uh, that's where the wellspring is, is that there could be several truths going on with every story and every mystery. And to your point earlier, Scott, uh, you were talking about the Jersey Devil. It could be applied to Patterson-Gimlin, all of those, is that, yes, there could be political machinations going on, which caused uh, this little uh, flap fake or not, or people were seeing things. It could be all of that. That political row could have been going on, and there also could have been weird things being seen in the woods. With Amelia Earhart, And I said this at the uh, Amelia Earhart, uh, Chasing Earhart conference in Atchison. You know, we're all debating here and people, you know, that's human nature. Or you, You spend 30 years of your life on one theory. I'm a crash and sink guy. I'm a lone survivor, or I, uh, you know, I'm a a, a castaway theory person. I'm a Japanese capture person. And when we talked about Bill Snavely's idea, which has, I, I think, really solid legs to it, it's not mutually exclusive. That plane that's down there could be an Electra 10E with a male and female occupant. But it also could be people different than Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. They also could have ended up in Japanese capture, but there could have been another plane. That's another theory that's been put out there. And I I know it's way out there, but that they had a backup with people who were lookalikes or just another set of uh, a pilot and navigator. They were meant to go missing to give time for the search to map the potential Pacific theater. There's, yeah, there are several theories. And that's a possibility. And if that's the case, there could have been two planes. There could have actually been doubles. There could have been another plane that was responsible for taking photos. There was an engineer who said he put a camera in the belly of the plane. So at Lockheed, so there's all that kind of stuff. So And so when we consider things, and again, it always goes back to, people poo-pooing eyewitness testimony, but like how many people does it take? And also, you know, there is a, talk about the the sign of the times, there is a cultural component to it. The Chamorros, the native indigenous peoples of the region there, and especially on Saipan, you know, how many people does it take to say, hey, I saw a white lady and a white dude on the island being escorted into captivity by the Japanese? A tall, skinny one with short hair. Yeah, which... (laughs) None of them were around at that point. It's like, how many people does it take? And so my point is that those two things could have been going on in regards to what mystery do we feel like uh, has been solved. I think that one has a pretty good foothold. When we got done with it, if you're asking um, a change of mind or just having an opinion that gets solidified, when we got done with that, I thought, 
okay, Japanese capture seems to make the most sense, even though people uh, would consider it way out, especially for something like, well, they just ran out of fuel, they crashed, and they're in the ocean, they sank. That's the easiest thing to believe. But again, you have to, I have to consider people seeing her and all this other testimony that went on and the reasons behind that. And it's like, to me, it's not all that far-fetched. So here's my thinking on solving the Amelia Earhart mystery and possibly one of the most uh, way out, exciting, tip the whole thing on its head scenarios is if you were able to recover Bill Snavely's plane. And hypothetically, you find that there were remains of a man and woman in there. but they're not Fred and Amelia, or one of them is Fred, the other one is not Amelia, or vice versa. That just opens the whole thing up like, okay, what's going on now? And so that's a pretty exciting uh, scenario. But it, with anything else, though, there could be multiple things going on at the same time that creates a multi-layered mystery, which makes it really hard to not only solve, but also for people to come to a general conclusion because they've gone along one line and that's it. I've spent 25 years. It's got to be this. And I can't give all that up. And if you entertain more than one theory, your odds of being correct go up. <laughs> good, good way to hedge your bets there, Forrest. <laughs> uh, well, the overall point, though, is that uh, we're always looking for, you know, we hear this so often, Occam's razor, Occam's razor. It's like there could be five Occam's razors going on at once. And I don't generally believe you want to talk about a conclusion after five years. I don't often think that it is the simplest explanation. And, and that's also kind of a slight misinterpretation of what Occam's razor to me means. Well, I just talked about it in Lady Wonder. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it was actually written by, I can't remember his name now, but he, he wrote it in defense of divine miracles. Right, right. That's the thing about Occam's razor. Everybody always uses it to debunk something or be skeptical about something. But the guy that wrote Occam's razor wrote it as an as the simplest explanation is that this is a miracle. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> well, that's oh, really that, yeah. Oh, they, that's what people that. always that's forget. Everybody like Occam's razor, Occam's razor, and it's like, do you know what that was originally written for? So it's like the phrase uh, "good enough for government work." Everyone uses it now to say, <laughs> "Nah, I did a shitty job." But yeah. actually, the phrase meant this is so good it could actually pass for government work. It's oh, like, it's I did not know so that. High. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, you know, I mean, depending on what side of the political fence you're on, but yeah, sure. the saying always meant, "Wow, this is so good." This is good enough even for government work. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Again, that's human nature. It's easiest to think about stuff when you fall to a simple thing, an aphorism, a thought, a saying that just kind of wraps it up and you can put it away nicely and don't have to think about it anymore because it's challenging. And it's, it's like uh, an eye for an eye. That's another one uh, uh, out of the Bible where people say like, well, there you go. If uh, I got to do the same exact thing to you, if you wrong me, really, I think the spirit of it is that it should be no more than an eye. If you lose an, like an eye for an eye, but don't take an eye, an arm, a leg, and burn the guy's house down. All right. It's William of Ockham, by the way. That's who it was. Oh, yes, that's right. Bill. William. Bill Ockham. Bill Ockham. Bill, you, you remember Bill, Bill Ockham? Ockham? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. The next question is from Eamon B. from Dublin, Ireland. Would you guys consider covering an Irish topic? I know you covered one about the Hellfire Club before. And do you ever argue on what the next episode is. Well, we did uh, cover Loftus Hall, which <laughs> to Scott's chagrin, I put a lot of Irish history from like the early 1600s on. And, yeah, uh, I tuned out. For because I found it fascinating. No, I love the original story. For me, it got a little mired in academia, but, or, 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 uh, <laughs> well, but it's a cool story. The history is fascinating, and uh, there do seem to be a lot of United Kingdom stories that come up. As Scott always says, it was all roads lead back to Scotland uh, and England. And, and it, yes, it is closer to, you know, they're English-speaking countries, so it's easier for us to get our heads around the data. But we've uh, actually covered stories from around the world, Russia, Japan. You, you know, we eventually get to them. But of course, yes, the the, the English speaking or originated stories, uh, we probably tend to get to first. And as far as how the process goes, I think Scott and I have a pretty good working relationship in regards to that. And that if one of us gets an idea, we'll pitch it to the other. We were just talking about uh, Rich's pitching a method. We have a similar thing, uh, you know, when he does uh, proposes an idea to a network or studio, Scott and I will have an idea. And We'll talk about it before we, we go to do it. Some things are pretty obvious, like he'll mention something. Uh, it, this just happened last night. I, I As I said earlier, it's like I've been watching uh, 
all of the uh, Twilight Zones in order. And I thought like, you know what? We should do like a one-off biography of Rod Serling. I just want to know more about that guy. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's it. Sold. And then sometimes we'll pitch something. It's like, well, uh, depending on how hard the work is like, well, that's going to, we got to turn one around really quickly. That's going to be a lot of research on this one. It's going to be hard to, uh, to get up and running from a dead stop. So let's do a simpler story and then he'll propose one or I will. And, um, that's how we choose a lot of like it, a psychic horse. <laughs> Exactly. Which you got bumped it, for. I'm going to keep reminding you. <laughs> oh, there's a, and, and then, oh. <laughs> Getting talking. bumped for a psychic horse. Story I, of my career. <laughs> I forgot to mention this, but uh, Rich will be bumped for that psychic chicken episode. And, but it reminded me of the, uh, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. And I, I love the Coen brothers and, and their work. And if you remember in that anthology series, all contained in one movie, the poor fellow who recited, uh, uh, he was an orator and he gets replaced by a chicken that picks numbers yeah, <laughs> and, and not in a good way. So that was, yeah. But anyway, I just thought of like, yeah, those acts were around. People would have a, a, a performing animal and uh, it's got to be better than Rich Hannum. Well, <laughs> of he, course. he works harder. Yeah. He performs more. Uh, you just have to give it chicken feed where Rich requires a, a dressing room. And, uh, and I snacks. want a pizza. I want some booze. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm all fine with that. That's why he's one of our favorite guests. Next question. Uh, Kate from Arkansas. If money, time, and coronavirus weren't issues, where would you most like to travel to record an episode on site? That's a great question. I, I love this question because we both want to travel more. And yes, there's obviously, <laughs> there's a lot going on right now that's not great for traveling. But I, you know, I know for me, my son's getting old enough that it actually is going to be possible for me to do more traveling coming up. We want to hit the road. And you know, one place that I really want to go is uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, I would like to go up there and visit our friend Jordan Bonaparte and uh, our graphic designer friend, Reese Waters. Uh, both of those guys have podcasts. Jordan has a nighttime podcast, been around for a while now, Canadian sort of, uh, like our show, but different and uh, doing very well. And Reese Waters had just started that new show that we talked about a few weeks ago called Canadian Politics is Boring, which is blowing up the <laughs> charts in Canada, which is pretty awesome. But uh, they both live not too far apart from each other and very close to Oak Island. So we wanted to go up there. And then I wanted to go there and also uh, do a show on the Shag Harbor incident, which is a UFO, USO story about uh, a UFO, a craft. That, that sounds like where Austin Powers vacation. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty or... cool. This UFO went down and <laughs> under the water in front of a whole town. Like everybody saw it, the cops, everybody. And then boats came and um, they dove and tried to get to it and it like left on its own accord so it's like really cool story which jordan has already covered but it'd be fun to go up there and hang out with those guys and do our own version of that maybe visit oak island that kind of stuff uh, we were about to do the brown mountain lights which are here in north carolina that was scheduled for a few weeks ago forrest was going to come out here we were going to go up to the mountains and hang out with micah hanks uh who lives very close to them coincidence i don't know uh but we we had all the plans. We had a, like a cabin rented. And we we're going to go up there and do a show and everything. And we had to put it aside for a minute, but we're still going to do that. So th those are a couple of things that we'd like to do. But we also have talked about, Forrest will say, you know, we've talked about like if we could afford it someday, like getting a an astonishing RV and, you know, heading out to the <laughs> Southwest. The mystery you know. machine. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and doing more of that kind of thing. And that, that might be in our future, depending on how our lives unfold over the next few years. Forrest, is there like one place, top of your list, the, you could only choose one, what would it be? My thinking skews usually towards magical realism. So I say the dark side of the moon. <laughs> okay, got it. But, but, but I'm not joking. Well, yeah, okay. if money and time, I, it's possible, I suppose. Uh, you know, you don't always, uh, what always uh, mystified me as a kid is you look at like a, uh, a mountain range and there's like a flat spot and it looks kind of... Uh, different from the others and it's like man i would love to be dropped off with a helicopter right there what's up there and it's also that same idea that all around the world are mysteries buried in specific spots and i remember that one uh it was an x-files episode where in the side of a mountain they find the frozen mummified remains of an alien it was a mountainside in alaska it's like how do they find that who tipped them off to that that specific spot? How'd they find that? And just imagine all the places you could go if you could uh, travel uh, omnipotently and, and just plop down and poke around. But the thing is, like, if you go to Oak Island, like, it's been so torn up. It'd be cool to see. I, I really would like to go there. Uh, as Scott mentioned, Skinwalker Ranch uh, would be fun for Scott and I to do a show there. That's been suggested to us quite a bit. And it's like, yeah, I... Uh, Scott and I go there with uh, with earth movers and and uh, really shake the place up, see what happens. 
Respectfully, of course. Like but the beehive, paranormal beehive. There's easier places to get. Chaco Canyon. Uh, Scott was going to take me to see the petroglyphs. Yeah, I love Chaco Canyon. It's an amazing place. The Anasazi ruins. Uh, yeah, there's so many places that uh, you can go that are interesting. But of course, yeah, as I said at the start of this question, that... Uh, I also tend to think I can't of the remember mystery. that. It was a long time ago. So about <laughs> 25 years ago, um, it's been changed. way before Mothman or any of that stuff. Canyon de Chelly, that's the place for the Anasazi ruins. If anybody wants to yes. go, and it's spelled C H E L L Y, just unbelievable, really amazing place. There's a spot apparently outside Taos, New Mexico. Uh-huh. Again, just a guy's story. Uh, years ago, he was out there cutting Christmas trees and bringing them back into town to sell. 40 miles out, he camps, you know, does this for several days. And one night he's out there camping and he wakes up to the sound of horses and he's looking around. There's nothing there, but he can hear horses. And the more he listens, he can hear the creak of wagon wheels. He can hear pots and pans and people talking. Oh, wow. And it gets louder and louder until it's all around him. And he's literally looking around like he's in the middle of a wagon train, but there is literally nothing there. And then it goes past him off into the distance. He hears it get quieter and quieter until it goes away completely. It took half an hour. Wow. That's amazing. I've never heard that story. Where'd you hear that story? I read it in a book called The Ghostly Register. Okay. And I always thought, I want to find that spot and I'm going to camp there for months until something (laughs) happens. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's a story like that, and I can't remember exactly where it is, but I think it's near Stonehenge, maybe, where people have heard horses and what sounds like knights riding at a spirited gallop or retreating or attacking or something like that. And you're you're in a field. You don't see anything, but you hear them. Yeah, there's plenty of stories of uh, uh, that. That happened. Uh, I can't remember where we covered it, but a, uh, a time slip where yeah, time suddenly slip, people yeah. heard a horse hooves on cobblestones and the clanking of armor. You know, is that stone tape theory? Is that a a little spot opening up where you can just hear but not see? All kinds of things going on. But it's not very common, but sometimes reported. All right. From Jake B. from Morris, New York. How many people hours of work go into a one-hour show? Um, Just a quick basic calculation. I actually thought about this the other day ahead of time, but I think it's probably around 100 hours. For all of us. Yeah, that's for everybody. That's me, Forrest, (laughs) uh, Sarah, our editor, our sound designer, tests um in our researchers too which you know i'm kind of guessing at how much time they're spending but you know I, 100 is probably conservative but i don't think wow. it's a ton more okay depends on the topic too like if it's real like force was saying if it's like loftus hall it's real deep or whatever it, it can go way up <laughs> <laughs> well this summer miller high life along with all of us from astonishing legends are raising a can to the simple moments worth celebrating here, here, my man. Well, you know, with everything going on in this big, wide, weird world of ours right now, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about, that feeling of uncertainty, what's around the corner. Well, you got to take a moment and appreciate the small wins, you know, and you really don't have to look that hard for them because it's all about getting back to that wholesomeness of our communities. It's cherishing the people we usually take for granted. You know what I'm talking about. And it's being there for each other. It's moving that backyard barbecue out into the front yard, put your lawn chairs in the driveway. And you bring out the coolers and you maintain your safe distance, but you get to know your neighbors again and your family and your friends and people that matter most to you. And Miller High Life, well, that's what they stand for as a brand because it goes hand in hand with that. Look, don't get me wrong. I can appreciate a complicated hipster IPA with a clever (laughs) name, which nine times out of 10 is encrypted as much as the next guy. But I had forgotten just how much joy and satisfaction there is in a domestic chore well done, then topped off by the crisp, clean, unpretentious taste of a full-flavored lager like Miller High Life. Exactly right. It's it's straightforward. It's quality beer that's available to everybody. And for me, it's a familiar lager flavor I always go back to. You know what I want in my life right now? Something that brings me a sense of being grounded. Less complications. (laughs) Yeah, and limited edition collector champagne cans will actually look pretty good in our Astonishing Legends studio background sets once we get them completed. Yeah, you know what? This is actually some pretty cool artwork. It's given me some other ideas for Astonishing Studios too, which are, quote, in development. But you know what? If you're interested in these really cool limited edition cans, they're available in stores right now. So go check them out before they're gone. In essence, Miller High Life was created to bring pride to the simple things in life. It's an iconic brand you can be proud to hold, to share, and to appreciate what you got. Miller High Life, the champagne of beers. A quality beer within everyone's reach. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Double, double, tales of trouble. 
podcast load and teapot bubble. We are the Shepherd Sister Twins, listening carefully as the story begins. Turn the lights down dark and low. Now it's time to get back to the show. Round Daddy from New Albany, Indiana wants to know, oh, this is weird. Do you think humanity could handle ET disclosure? So this means like actual alien biological entities from other physical planets. Uh, do you think humanity could handle it, the disclosure of that, or would you expect that people would be too irrational in their behavior? What do you guys think? You know, that's what people have been saying for a long time, why there hasn't been disclosure. So, you know, all society would collapse, all that kind of stuff. My answer is like, I don't think that's a black and white area. I think it's a little bit of a gray area. I think both things would happen. I think some people would really freak out and other people would be like, wow, this is amazing. I don't know that society would collapse. It would probably be a tougher question, I think, for religion than it would political systems. I mean, it's and it's dependent on its nature. Like if you marched E.T. out in front of the White House, that would be very much of a like, what? You know, that might be – it depends on how you do it, I think. You know, if you, yeah. if you yeah. plop yeah. some because, goo down yeah. and say this pile of goo came here and it's smarter than we are – and it's been around for 10 million years longer than we have. It's And it's actually us from the future or whatever. I guess it would depend on how different it was from what we might be expecting in our minds. I think. It depends on what that disclosure is. Like Scott said, if there's a, uh, <laughs> the, the, the day the earth stood still, hey, it's a white guy, it's a space brother, and he's got a message for us. It's like, get along or we're going to, we're going to zap this place before it's Keanu Reeves. But Scott and I just looked at a story uh, from Evora, Evora, Portugal, where white filament uh, material came down after a UFO sighting in the small town. It was all over everything. It was noticed by uh, their Air Force pilots. It was noticed uh, by professors. It was studied on the microscopic level. It seemed like this thing was living. There were microscopic organisms that put out tendrils of some kind. It's a really uh, fascinating encounter story because it was studied for a while. It was uh, captured. You could easily see it. And it was over everything. It was like uh, this really fine spider web or what they call, it's also called the uh, the angel hair. Angel hair. Incident. Yeah, that's right. I was just trying to look it up. That's what they called it. And yeah, people looked at it under a microscope and it's like, man, this thing is growing. It's alive. It seems to respond. It, it grows and it dies or goes away and dissolves uh, to a degree. It's kind and, of like the alien version of ectoplasm. <laughs> it is its own thing. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And what if that's like, yep, that's uh, it's sentient. We somehow it responds, it reacts intelligently, but we can't figure it out. That's a, like, okay, that's life from off this planet. Didn't come from here. It's got a, maybe it's got a different cellular structure, different DNA helix uh, sequence. It's not from this planet. That's alien. But people are like, eh, look at that. This is space garbage. And Forrest, what's the deal with this stuff? But then it sort of just dissolved away is the idea. I believe when you looked at it, yeah, how it happened is that uh, there was a UFO sighting. I, I And I can't remember exactly how. Uh, those were like uh, obloid, semi-oval spheres that were seen in Portugal by a lot of people. Right after that, this filament material started to fall and started to collect. Uh, one of the accounts is by an Air Force pilot who just noticed like, man, it's all over the inside of the cockpit. Like, what's going on? And uh, it could be easily washed off. But of course, samples of it were taken and studied by the scientists of the time. I think this was the late 50s, mid to late 50s, maybe when, the, when it first happened. And it's been talked about and studied since, but people don't know what to make of it. And so when you look at it under a microscope, you could see that uh, it was tendril-like little tiny organisms that seem to uh, respond to stimuli. So it reacts to UV light, according to this article I'm looking at, that about that particular. The flip side of this is there are people that right. say that has to do with uh, tiny spiders flying through the, that are like flying on the <laughs> air and like producing. It would have to be trillions, trillions of tiny little spiders making webs. I get, well, that's Charles Fort right there. That's also very, very Fortian. I know this uh, question was directed to you guys, but I'm here so you get my yeah, opinion for free. <laughs> um, I'm not a disclosure guy. I'm I'm not a person who believes that the government knows more about UFOs than we do. I know there are some people who who take such a broad view that it's like there's physical aliens and there's also these sort of interdimensional aliens that are only sort of not physical, then they're more physical, but they can kind of dial up and down their physical presence in our reality, which is more of the psychic alien 
theory. That's the one I lean mm-hmm. toward. Mm-hmm. Um, disclosure is tough because at, at this point in our history, what would you believe anyway? If the government, if the president came out and said, here are the aliens, I'm going to tell you that easily half the world, certainly half this country, just wouldn't believe they'd go, well, right. that's a lie that's being done for some weird political reason to get reelected or yeah. something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or to increase some budget on something. You wouldn't believe it. Like, how could you believe it? That's what I'm saying is it, it depends on how it's presented. Like I said, if it's the aliens themselves, whatever form they are, if they're ultra terrestrials and they manifest uh, on everyone's TV all at once, on every on every uh, digital screen that we all have and said, hey, we exist, we're here, and uh, we want you to get along because you're you're bumming us out, man. That's different because that comes from outside of a government. But you're, I believe... I believe you're absolutely right. If it came from some government entity and they just announced like, yeah, we've been studying these things for quite a while and, and we have proof. I mean, we don't have anybody here with us that you could talk to, but here's some film or video, you know, people, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. They're not even if buy. they showed something, I mean, I'm not there. I can't see it. I can't touch it. And then it's gone again. And it's like, well, what's and not only that, but what was the purpose of revealing this information right now? Yeah, people are starting to wonder about that. But, and if you want to know how people are going to behave, take a look at uh, what's going on with coronavirus and COVID-19. Some people uh, act with aplomb. They they follow the directions. Some people freak out and buy all the toilet paper at their local store. It's like, oh my God. And they they just lose it and they can't handle it. And they- With something is relatively like, okay, it's a new kind of flu that humans have not been exposed to. And so it's going to operate differently in human people's bodies. Yeah. And people are already free. It's, you know, oh, it's a hoax. It doesn't really exist. Well, it does exist, but it was from outer space. Oh, no, it's from this country. It's from that country. Yeah. I mean, and that's just America. That's just how people react. And I think it's a good lesson in a smaller scale, even though it's global, of just like everybody reacts however they're going to. Right. It kind of brings us into the next question from Brian Jensen from Pittsburgh. He wonders, what is the starkest difference you know between how Americans and those from another culture typically perceive or regard a given paranormal experience? I mean, this is just like a a very rudimentary view based on just, you know, what we've been doing the past several years. I can't say that I've been to every other culture and then stood with them while UFO flew over, you know, but, mm. but in terms of like the, the aftermath and what we read in uh, research and, and the articles that we see, I don't know, to me, I think Americans as a whole are a little more skeptical and distrustful in the majority, but I don't know how strong that majority is, but like, especially we have a lot of people that listen to our show and they love to entertain these ideas. But it does seem to me, Forrest, and I don't know if you agree with me, that their other cultures are much more willing to accept the unexplained and even look for a more spiritual connection to it or look back to it historically than America. America is very much more to me, it's about the now and could this exist now? And like I said, I think distrustful of, I mean, we have such a complex war machine here. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on. We know that stuff exists that we don't know what it is. We, you know, you look at the SR-71 Blackbird, how long it was around, the X-37B, all these aircraft and things, you know, so I think a lot of times when people see something in America, they're like, one of the first thoughts might be, that's probably some technology they have that we don't know about yet. And they're not going to tell us about it for until they retire it which is what, what the military does. So I don't know, because it's, it seems like when you read about sightings in Brazil or Mexico or uh, some of these other uh, South American countries, they seem more willing, even on the governmental level, to acknowledge that it's something unexplained. That's what I see in the press anyway. That's a different viewpoint. And it's also specifically pointed at uh, UFOs. If you're talking about more supernatural things, I believe uh, it has a lot to do uh, how a society reacts about their culture. There are other societies that are, uh, and, and countries that are much more homogenous. The United States is, you know, we're a cultural mishmash. We got uh, backgrounds from everybody, which makes, I think, America great. Uh, we got people from everywhere and it's constantly changing. It's in flux. Um, and those people bring their cultural dispositions with them. It's like, well, we just covered the Kira object and uh, Japanese folklore and and how they view spirits that wander around and it's a culturally rich and diverse uh panoply of uh, of yokai and different types of spirits and that's the the lens that they view it through and uh in some cases they're much more open to talking about it 
if you look at Americans, like, yeah, I think what's, what Scott is saying is that, and Micah Hanks really covered this well as far as uh, uh, UFOs in the media and, and uh, how governments view it, and especially with uh, newspaper media, New York Times, there was this whole, um, in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, very dismissive attitude. It's like, come on, we're, we're Americans. We're all smarter than this, right? This is all baloney. And that's just talking about UFOs. When it comes to ghosts, certainly paranormal phenomena happens all over the world. There are accounts from everywhere. But I would say, yes, um, Asians are going to act differently than Africans. Europeans, Eastern Europeans are going to act slightly differently than Western Europeans because of their cultural uh, traditions and past and how they view things and how their culture has dealt with it for a thousand years. So that's a little different when you when you talk about uh, things that are more, I think, supernatural when it comes to uh, nuts and bolts, if you want to say UFO business, our government, for whatever reason, has had that attitude of like, nothing to see here, folks. You're all crazy. If you think about it, you're if you talk about it at all, you're nuts. And other foreign governments have had a more open approach because maybe they don't have uh, the secrets that ours do, you know, or the motivations that uh, our government does. But they do seem to be a little more open to it and especially open with their military talking about it. So, yeah, it just depends, I think, on what type of paranormal phenomenon you're talking about. Here's a mystery you can solve right now. Becky from Chicago says, Scott, we've heard about all the places you're from. Forrest, we keep hearing you're sort of from the Northwest-ish. <laughs> Where exactly are you from? Here's your chance, Forrest. Clear that it up. That will be revealed one day soon. Uh, yeah, maybe next year. But uh, here's the story I've, I've often told people when they ask. And I, it, again, it takes, you know, things take on a life of their own. It, it, they create their own mythologies. And so when we talked about this earlier and the ramifications of being yourself on the interwebs, that opens you up to a lot. Or you could hide behind a character, but that's really hard to keep up. So Scott and I deciding like, well, we are going to be ourselves and use our real names. But with that, as far as you know, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I just don't have time to get out to, to fill out the rest of my online profile, you could say. <laughs> but because uh, I'll just tell you, I'm from eastern Washington, northern Idaho panhandle area, but we have family and uh, some property that extends into western Montana. It's one acre, so it's, it's not a lot of property, but uh, you know, our, our family comes from there. I'm from the region, and, and part of it is like, yeah, I, I, I've lived in one, one spot or the other. But the reason for not being specific, and I'm not sure if I've said this on the air, I have to people at, at meetups and stuff, it's really to deflect any negative criticism we might get or harassment. And we certainly didn't know what we would get. We knew that some of these topics we would cover could be controversial. People have very strong ideas. And it's probably why, to answer another question, why we don't really get deep into conspiracy theories. Boy, you want to open up a can of worms with people that have uh, plenty of time on their hands to flood you with emails and vitriol. That's it. Part of it is to uh, shield my family that is still living up there. And I'll just say, because some of them could be mistaken for me up there, you know, so they don't need that. My, you know, parents and other relatives, they're older. They don't have time for that or the energy. And frankly, I don't either. But it is that was it started off as that effort. And uh, just to kind of protect them from any baloney that might be happening because of my actions. So I just generally don't specify the town. But I will say there are a lot of people in the Facebook group and certainly people that know me that uh, it's, it's not a secret. They know where I'm from. I just don't announce it on the show. So no comment. <laughs> yes, uh, e Eastern Washington, uh, Northern Idaho panhandle. So uh, uh, just get a map out, take a look at the, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the uh, back east where every 20 feet's a new town. So you'll get an idea where I'm from. So Walker from Cornwall in the UK says they're a recent convert and they want to know what your thoughts are on the recent Maje UFO flap. Uh, which I believe is a UFO, uh, some UFO story from Brazil about a crashed saucer. Yeah, this came out in mid-May and there were all these videos and then a bunch of stuff disappeared. Uh, I, there's an article about it on Vice, actually, if you look it up, UFO over Maje Brazil sparks social media panic and conspiracies. We haven't looked at this really very closely. People are saying, oh, it was a big deal. And then all the videos disappeared. And we were talking about it off the air here a second ago. And Rich, you just quickly found that MUFON Brazil is dismissing it as a hoax, I guess. Uh, that's an article in the Express UK from about nine hours ago says, and they don't go into explaining why it's a hoax or how it's a hoax. They just uh -huh. say they've looked into it and they feel it's an elaborate hoax. Uh -huh. Disinformation. Uh -huh. Is it disinformation? But that's MUFON. You can trust them generally. <laughs> or is so. it? 
Yeah, it, yeah, that's true. Is Could that, be a press release. Yeah. Anybody can do a press release. But I mean, it is something, it might be an interesting thing to look into, but we're we're so buried in the current pipeline of shows that we haven't really taken a serious look at it. However, it's the sort of topic that we're working on developing a, a YouTube show of some kind for next year, not right away, but we're trying to get prepared for that. It would be the kind of topic that we'd talk about on that, just point blank, just be like, Scott, all right, let's Scott, see. I just got to say, I remember, though, when the New York Times articles came out in December of 2017. Yeah. I remember getting on the phone with you, and y- you were kind of freaked out. And then, like, I started getting freaked out based on that because you were like, wait, what's going on here? Like, is this disclosure? Like, is something really happening here? Like, and I, I said I'm not a disclosure guy, but I was picking up on your, like, wait a second, what's really going on here? Why is this happening? And then I remember that night just being like, Scott's a little worried. Now I'm getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the front page of the Times, that's still a big deal. But that yeah. whole thing, though, once you get the 10,000 foot view on it and you look at To the Stars Academy being wrapped up with it and Tom DeLong and all that stuff that's happening, it does seem a little more like manipulated media to a certain extent to me, but by the same token, and even though the To The Stars Academy continues to be releasing information and keeping that in the headlines, there's a lot to that footage being confirmed recently by the Pentagon as authentic of what Commander Fravor saw in his aircraft off the Nimitz. And Yeah, but what they're saying is that they're not confirming what it is. They're simply confirming that, yes, this is actual footage from where they say it is from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's so funny because then there were people who reacted by saying, oh my God, the Pentagon just said there's UFOs and no one's even talking about it. And it's like, there are people who always link UFO with alien. Mm-hmm. And if the government says, well, this is footage we can't explain, they're like, oh, so what you're saying is there's aliens. And it's like, well, no, that's not at all what they're saying. I think for you and me and Forrest, the story was the story. The very fact that it was being covered or yeah. discussed in any way was surprising because it typically isn't. And typically when UFOs are talked about in the media, it is a sort of, you know, and now on the lighter side, yeah. you know, our <laughs> final story tonight, apparently the little green men have arrived. It's all winky, yeah. winky, funny, ironic, bullshit. And this one wasn't. And that is what was interesting. Not that anything in particular is being revealed, right? right. Yeah. It, especially in light of uh, was I what I just mentioned with Micah Hanks talking about the history of how the New York Times specifically handled these stories and that it seemed to go hand in hand with the government view. And one of the last major uh, series of articles or, or an article that was um, it seemed to be like the final word from the New York Times was it would serve us better to look at the psychology behind these stories and the people that tell them. So it was like, there's no UFOs, but yeah, if you want to study these nutbags that think there are, that might be some of use to sociologists and psychologists. Well, it's funny because I totally agree that the experiencer is where the answers lie, but not from a, well, let's find out why people think they see these things. And more like, wait, People are having experiences. What are they and why are they having them and other people aren't? And Yeah, that was the attitude of the times because it's like, let's look at why they have them. So none of this rubs off on the rest of us. It's like, this is a weird disease, this seeing of things. Rather more urgent question from a person who identifies themselves as a tiger in man's clothing from the wilds (laughs) of rural Arizona asks... (laughs) What was your most unfortunate hairstyle choice? And I think you guys should put pictures in the show notes. Oh, (laughs) boy. I don't know if I... (laughs) Well, right now I'm being forced to have not a great hairstyle choice, thanks to quarantine and also being bald or getting... (laughs) getting (laughs) Why do you think we're wearing hats? Yeah, Yeah. we're wearing hats on on Zoom here. But um, I think probably my most unfortunate was a feathery kind of mullet type deal that I had in 1986 that I would wear with my black members only jacket and my shark's tooth (sighs) necklace. Oh my God. Where were you living at the time? I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina high school. Okay. Yeah. That tracks. Yeah. All right. Uh, (laughs) Forrest, do you want to, uh, did you ever have an unfortunate hairstyle choice? We all had the same similar hairstyle. There wasn't a whole lot of variation, at least in the area that I was from and everywhere else. Every, everyone had the same kind of, you know, People were using blow dryers, uh, a more feathered kind of look. Uh, but your hair was never super long, was it? Like, what's the longest no. your hair ever got? 
right now, because of the quarantine, it's <laughs> been the longest right. it's been since probably high school. But back, back then, it's like I never had a mullet. But yeah, it, it's grown. Yeah, when say, I say I had a mullet, I'm not talking Billy Ray Cyrus here. I just had like a, it was a little <laughs> longer in the you know. Come on, right? Well, <laughs> Joe. Uh, well, speaking of uh, Tiger and Man's clothing, uh, the mullet sported by Joe Exotic, I think is yeah, that's uh, nothing like that. A current yeah. example, but uh, I'll just say this to the kids. You know, the, the Bieber floppy haired thing and then uh, parents with uh, older kids or at least uh, the sullen teenager years with the big overgrown floppy mop head uh, hairstyles. That's nothing new about that. That was going on in the 80s. Yeah. Everything old is new again. Elizabeth B. from Kansas wants to know, what is your favorite urban legend? as opposed to an astonishing legend. <laughs> These are very well, different things. They're all a little astonishing if you're the uh, on the receiving end of them. I, I say for me, The Vanishing Hitchhiker. I think that's the first urban legend that was being kicked around. And back uh, in my college days, my friend Kerry gave me that book. And it's like, what's this? This is what this is called, an urban legend? And The Vanishing Hitchhikers is one of the bigger ones. And and uh, I think that's why we did such a long series on uh, The Lady in White. And, Resurrection uh, Mary. Resurrection Mary, because it seems to be a trope that goes on and on and on and is from all over the world. I live about a mile from a famous bridge with a vanishing hitchhiker, like right now. Crying uh, uh, Crybaby Bridge? No, what, what's no, your, Lydia's uh, Bridge. Lydia. Lydia, yeah. that's right. Lydia's Bridge. Yeah, there's something. What is it about that act, that specific scenario and act? of someone getting into your car, you take them somewhere and they and they vanish. Uh, and again, it's just this thing that keeps happening over and well, over again. Is hitchhiking even still a thing? <laughs> no, people showing up though. Uh, there are stories of uh, cab drivers uh, after Fukushima that would pick oh, up yeah. passengers. And it's like, I want to go home. And he was like, oh, okay, well, that area is quarantine. And he turns around and they're gone. You know, and then before that, carriage rides, uh, different modes of transportation. It has to do something with being on the road, transporting people to their desired resting place or home. There's something to it. So it's fascinating to me. You know, now that we have Lyft and Uber, I <laughs> wonder if there'll be a new class of ghost story, urban legend that's simply centered around weird things that have happened to Lyft and Uber drivers. With any luck, they'll have a camera. We've heard of a few stories. One of them was our guest, an author we interviewed, was a, uh, a shared ride driver and had his own experience. I guess he gave the guy a ride, turns around, and the guy is gone. It's one of those where possibly this guy could have quietly opened the door and left without paying or anything and just split. But he turned around and the, and the guy was gone. Or he, he had just gotten into the car. It's like, okay, maybe he snuck out and didn't want the ride, but he crouched down so I couldn't see him in an instant. And then I also love the one because, again, uh, you know, everything that makes an impact is usually personal. And, and my friend uh, that we also talked about in Resurrection Mary had a reverse vanishing hitchhiker where they were the hitchhikers and the car vanished that they were riding in. That's the one. That's the weirdest of all. Yeah, that's yeah, the that one, one I can't get over. I love that one. I think for me, the urban, I, it's simple. It's, you know, we used to get those emails called the Darwin Awards in the early days of the internet <laughs> or news of the weird it was a really great yeah. email list. Uh, but the one urban legend that I loved, and I've never have determined whether or not it was a true story or not. And I think they even did it on Mythbusters was the guy who got the jet assisted takeoff unit and strapped it to the roof of his car mm. and it launched the car into a cliff wall and just killed him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think That's, he had an Impala well, well, and he put this, basically a jet engine on the, bolted it to the car somehow and then lit it up and the car took off and smashed into the side of a cliff. But mm. you're saying that that was not a Darwin Award, that was an urban legend. It that was an happened. urban legend, I think. I don't, it, and a Darwin Award. I don't know if it really, it seems like <laughs> far-fetched, but maybe it happened, I don't know. I, I love that story. Though. Maybe that's up there with you know what they say with rednecks in, in the South or whatever. It'd just be like the famous last words are, "Hey everybody, look at me!" <laughs> hold hold my beer. It's a hold my beer moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. Okay. Now th this next one again. You just you each get one, and that's it. Okay. But, mm -hmm. but I do want to know why. The question is, Scott Forrest, what is your favorite cryptid? You know, I'm not sure. It's technically a cryptid. I think it is. But uh, for me, it's probably the puck wedgie. Yeah, I'm going to say not a cryptid. Not a cryptid? I don't think so. Okay, well, then in that case. That's a spirit being. Yeah. Then I'm, I, 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 you know, this is not an exciting answer, but it's going to be Bigfoot. I mean, it's just, <laughs> that's what it is. All right. Yeah, especially after doing Patterson Gimlin. Forrest, yeah. what about you? I'm always going to love Patty and Bigfoot because I grew up with that. But I think the ones that uh, haunt my thoughts 
are the two types of creatures that friends of mine have said they've seen. And one is uh, my uh, a good friend of mine uh, who saw a what she called a jughead. I, I've explained that on the show, and it was uh, that's a real hybrid cryptid. You know, I, I see cryptid as an animal that should not exist, or it's a it's some kind of weird amalgamation of, of several animals that should not exist, or its own thing. And that was like a yeah, as she said, an antelope type body with stripes and a circular round head with a very um, intuitive face that looked at her and kept on walking. Almost human and, face. And, yeah. Gross. And that's called a jug head? She was little. So she's like, uh, I think she said she was oh, seven or eight. And as a kid, it's just like, I know animals. I love animals. That's not a real animal. That's nothing I've seen in, in books. It came out of the bushes, walked across the lawn, turned and looked at her. And that's another uh, significant aspect of cryptids that I love is the ones that, you know, like Patty, they turn, they look at you, they recognize you like, hey, what's going on? Yeah, don't come near me, but nice to meet you. I got to be on my way. But this is a story from a person you know, but have yes. you ever heard anything has anyone else ever heard of a jughead or an animal like that? <laughs> no, and and that's another part of the phenomenon is that uh, <sighs> there's some here in North Carolina that are like that too that are less well known. I actually wanted to have a friend on really? about it. Yeah, um, down near the coast, like a, a creature like that. No, not like a jughead. Uh, more like. <laughs> uh, it's hard to describe. I, I want to save okay. it for when we get to a show. A little shout out to Tommy there. Again, the second one I've, I've talked about quite a bit, and I like it because, again, it's somebody I know and trust. It's Rob Christofferson's kangaroo beast with a man face. <laughs> yeah, that's that a good he one. Saw. That is a good one. <laughs> again, because it's that moment of like, hey, what's up, buddy? Yeah, I'm a kangaroo with a guy's face. All right, take care. And he hops off. And it's Fun frightening. picturing Rob uh, encountering that. I just, <laughs> yeah. uh, if anyone in the audience is really good at doing like cartoons or drawing, would you please draw Rob Christofferson meeting up <laughs> with the kangaroo with the human face? I would well, do anything. <laughs> I say we we throw Rob some bucks so he can have the great Desdemona, who does a lot of his uh, really great, uh, terrific graphic effects work and, and original art, to draw it up for him. And and there you go. That's a Rob K T shirt. It's a little <laughs> personal though. I mean, he he saw that. Like it was at five in the morning, five thirty in the morning as he's walking to work. It's dark. It's kind of cold and creepy. And uh, I'm not sure maybe it's something he wants to revisit, but he he does talk about it. So just quickly, I want to say that I just watched uh, something a few weeks ago about jackalopes and they determined mm. that they were real because the rabbits had like a virus type thing that would create ah, um, yes. these horns on their head from the virus. So they think that's what like trappers and the original stories of where those came from. And they even showed rabbits with this. And that's where the jackalope came from. It's actually a real thing in that case. There's that's a amazing. Case. Yeah. I'd never heard that. That's the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Nate Murphy from Somerset, Massachusetts asks, any chance you're ever going to do a deep dive into the Bridgewater Triangle? I've never even heard of that. You, you haven't heard of it? I've heard of the, really? the Bermuda Triangle. Right. Well, it's in the triangle of genre. It's in the triangle series. <laughs> and yes, we've been asked to cover this uh, a fair amount, and we will one day, but it is a big, sprawling topic. Most of my knowledge comes from watching a few documentaries on it, and it's just fascinating. It is it is one of those thin places, a uh, hole punched in reality, where this area of Massachusetts, uh, which is, I think, the points of the triangle roughly are these three small towns. And within that, all kinds of stuff, the kitchen sink of the paranormal is found. UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, all this weird phenomena is happening. Uh, so it is, it's a lot like Skinwalker of the Northeast. And Scott? I don't know much about it other than I know it by its name. But I mean, I think um, Forrest has brought it up before and we've been asked about it before. So yeah, I mean, we'd absolutely do that. We could definitely put it in the pipeline. All right. Again, those stories are a little hard. It's like the people that didn't, you know, we had a few comments that like, I really could not follow Skinwalker. It's like, yeah, it's a, you know, or Mothman because it's a mishmash of a bunch of different stuff happening and you got to make your own connections. Yeah. If you can follow Skinwalker, you don't understand Skinwalker. <laughs> That's right. It's like explaining nice. quantum physics. Nat from Long Island wants to know, Scott, why did you move away from Forrest? Do you miss being together for the show? And by the way, you moved away from me too. So I, I think we're all looking for some answers. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I, it does. Uh, this question made me a little sad. I, you know, I, it's a big question, but I, I moved out of necessity for my family. My wife and I met in college in North Carolina, and uh, we married young. In fact, we had our 25th anniversary last year, and uh, 
we have an 11 year old and we've been living in big cities pretty much since we got out of school. We did nine years in Los Angeles then nine years in Manhattan and then seven years and continuing back in Los Angeles. And we were basically just ready for a simpler life. And we also wanted our son to be closer to his aging extended family, but just tired of living in the big city. Honestly, I, I was tired of all the traffic. And in Los Angeles, when I lived there the first time, traffic was bad, but it was it was doable. And then when I left for nine years, or we all did, and then we came back, it was like three times worse. And it, I, I just got to a point where I shut down. I was like, if I'm not living real close to where I'm working, which I got to do as a podcaster, I didn't want to be there. When I was still freelance editing in LA, and I would I would book a gig for four or five weeks in um, Santa Monica, and I lived over in, in Studio City, and it would take me like an hour to go eight miles. That made me want to just, I cannot do this every day. So I just, I was ready to be done with all that. However, my wife still goes back and forth for work to LA between there and here in North Carolina. She's with us now because of all the COVID stuff and working from home. But to answer the bigger part of the question, I absolutely miss hanging out with Forrest in person and you a little bit, Aww. Rich, uh, as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Less off. As long as I'm in y'all. there somewhere. No, I mean, yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm glad we got to do it for five years of doing the show. and um, But for COVID and everything else, I, we were going to be getting back together. The, the reason we're, we're separated more now because of the lockdown of everything. Of course, he's going to Waverly. He'll go see a sanatorium, but he won't come see me. So, um, Well, why but, not a sanatorium? It's the perfect place during a... A, a lung infection. Yeah, that. yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you're really pressing your luck. Not only getting on the airplane, but you're going to go there. Everybody's going to be freaking out. But um, if I uh, catch and I, something I, from I mean a on ghost, both sides, yeah. yeah. Right. If I catch something uh, from a spirit, the best episode ever. Yeah. But I mean, we're still going to be getting together. And once things calm down in terms of travel and all that, we're going to be hanging out and probably, you know, he was, my wife and I have a a fair amount of extra room here at our place in North Carolina. So you can come and stay for a while and we'll probably do shows together while he's here. So yeah, I miss like hopping in the car and going to meet him at Hyperion Public and having a beer (laughs) and talking about what we're going to do next week and just all that stuff. You know, we're on Zoom every day for hours and hours. But it's not the same. I will say uh, just one comment here. Yeah. Uh, and and that, Scott, that was lovely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right back at you, buddy. But yeah. people do ask us about the, the creative process. Uh, how is it different being separated in a location and being able to do this with technology? And I will say there is a dynamic. You know, that's why when Rich was, we were all here and we wanted Rich uh, to come into the studio because there is a conversational dynamic that is special and specific to having a group of friends around a table talking about this stuff, which is the original spirit and idea of the show is friends getting together, talking about fun, weird stuff and having a good time. And uh, the audience is included to sit in on that. And, and so when Scott and I used to do the shows sitting across from each other, yes, technically it's easier and cleaner, especially for our editor to have separate tracks that are isolated. So Scott's in, he's recording a track right now. I'm recording my own track right now. And so there's no, especially when we used to interrupt each other a lot, there's no crossover bleed uh, of voices or his mic picking up my voice as I'm finishing something and and vice versa. So it's a lot cleaner and easier to edit for Sarah. On the other hand, even with Zoom and being able to see his face, there is something that you do miss a little bit, which is having somebody, it's that energy and it's the fun. And uh, there's a vibe there when somebody's sitting uh, three feet away from you and and you're, you're just talking, uh, you're getting deep into thought and conversation. And, and we all know that's what we're missing right now. Well, we got to plan another time when we all meet up probably out there and the three of us will get back in the, in the room together. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Six feet apart, but yes. My place Uh, here in North Carolina has a large unfinished room that I'm thinking of finishing and turning into like a, a studio type recording area. It would be perfect for that. these days, it seems like companies are putting CBD in everything, does it not? It absolutely does. I'm expecting to uh, have it offered as a bagel topping at my local bagel shop, which, of course, I can't go inside of. <laughs> I don't know. Though, that sounds like a pretty good idea, actually, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's available somewhere. Well, if you don't know where to start, there's a company in Vermont that's down to earth and doing things differently, and that's Sunsoil. In the last few years, I have really started to pay attention to labels. I want to know what's in a product I'm taking. And what I've learned is the simpler, the better. And Sunsoil keeps it very, very simple. Most of their CBD products have just two ingredients, coconut oil and hemp. I mean, how nice is that for a change? 
uh, it is very nice, and I can really appreciate how transparent they are as a company and a brand. And they're really focused on sustainability, which is very important to them, as well as us. And not only that, but this is, in fact, a USDA certified organic CBD oil. And that's an important distinguishing factor here because it is a much stricter standard than the general term organic, which is, of course, as we know, used in so much marketing nowadays. Yeah, and what we mean by doing things differently is that they grow and extract it all themselves on this beautiful farm in Vermont. It's absolutely stunning. But my point is, they are taking control of this product, like you said, transparent. And they take great pride in offering CBD oil of superior quality at half the price of other brands. Yeah, and as I've said before, for me personally, using sun soil before I go jogging seems to help keep enough of the pain and inflammation away from my problem spots so I can keep going further. And I've been using the sun soil 20 milligram CBD liquid soft gels. I, I take them about 30 minutes before my run, and it really does seem to make a difference. These soft gels are easy to take, and it's a good dose for me. I, there's no heavy feeling that I was worried about, just a sense of calm. So sometimes I'll actually take it before bed too. Sun soil makes pure and simple CBD products at an unbeatable price price. Get 30% off your first order by going to sunsoil.com slash legends. That's S-U-N-S-O-I-L dot com slash legends for 30% off your first order. Again, that's S-U-N-S-O-I-L dot com slash legends. You know, it's really unsettling to think about how much we store on our phones, and we don't think about what would happen if we lost that data. Oh, yeah. Think about all the memories, the birthday parties, the, the holidays, family get-togethers. Yeah, I was going over everything that has taken up most of the space on my phone, and it's stuff I would never want to lose. Oh, of course not. But we just carry all that stuff around with us everywhere we go without a care in the world. Exactly, which is why you and I trust and rely on SanDisk Data Storage. It's a brand we trusted for a long time. Well, yeah, going back to the very beginning of when we first started to use memory cards. Take it from us. You don't want a bargain shop for data storage because you're just gambling with it. You might as well just delete it all. Cheap data storage fails all the time. If you have an Android device, then the SanDisk is what you need to back up your precious data and free up space. They have options that range from 32 gigabytes up to one terabyte of storage. One terabyte. That blows my mind. I know, it's kind of freaky, isn't it, how they can get all that storage onto those little tiny thumbnail cards. But really, SanDisk has reliable storage solutions for any device you might have. For example, remember I was telling you about that uh, Microsoft Connect SLS cam, the one that takes supposedly ghost images and turns them into stick figures? Yes. Well, that thing runs off of an Android-based tablet, which itself doesn't have very much storage, and I don't really trust it. So all I did was simply insert an extreme micro SD UHS-1 card into the slot and and bam, 256 gigabytes of storage. Didn't have to worry about it. Also, the super fast read and write speeds on that card means everything transfers off of it to a jump drive or to the cloud simply and securely. And it just worked perfectly. Or if you have an Android device that uses the Type-C uh, USB port, you can get the Ultra Dual Drive Lux USB Type-C flash drive for it. And for those of you with an iPhone or iPad with a lightning port, well, they have the iExpand flash drive go. And I actually just ordered this one myself because what you do with it is you dump all your photos and videos or contacts onto this thing, takes it off your phone, bam, storage solution solved. It's nice. And it's offline too, which is the best kind of backup you can have. Exactly. Listen, you know what? Take our advice. Free up space on your phone with SanDisk. Right now, our listeners get 10% off their first order of these featured SanDisk products, but only when you go to SanDisk.com slash legends. That's S-A-N. D-I-S-K dot com slash legends. Don't wait. Sandisk dot com slash legends. I'm Ryan Mills, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Samantha C. asks, and she's got a few. Uh, first part, in controlled remote viewing, there's a lot of talk about time, viewing the past, the present, the future. So if there was a military project such as Stargate for actual time travel, would either of you consider participating? Yeah, just so I could have the possibility of really messing things up. <laughs> it's like, why are we all cyborgs now? Because that idiot went back in time. 
<laughs> and he had a bite of a donut that he wasn't supposed to. The butterfly uh, that effect. screwed up. A, yeah, that that those crumbs <laughs> fell into the experiment, and now we're all half machine. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yes, yeah, of course, of course, they would. I'm hoping that Samantha is part of a secret military branch that's vetting us, and this is her way of trying to find out. And, and then if, if we say the answer, she'll we'll get us a, a letter or, or a black Cadillac will pull up and take us away. Um, well, Forrest is already out. Yeah. Based on that criterion, Forrest is out. <laughs> no, what, what, uh, you, but Scott, you yes. know how these things work from 90, 80s and 90s movie. They don't ask you. you the, the van pulls up, throws you in. Yeah. You have a bag over your head, and then it's like, Mr. Philbrook, uh, we have no time to explain. We need you. Yeah. America needs you. The world <laughs> needs you. Like, well, for what? I just go back in time and see if you get killed. That's yeah. I, you know what? I would go. I would absolutely go. But only if I could come back to this timeline as it is, you know, with my family. If it is, I would have to be able to get back. But yeah, that's my big thing. Or is take that, them uh, with me. If the, if the other timeline's a better <laughs> place to hang out, they get to go with me. Okay, now I'm going to ask the third question second. Okay. Uh, this will be a quick one. Who is scarier, Tim Curry's clown in It, the TV movie It, or Kurt Barlow in Salem's Lot, which mm. also, I believe, refers to the TV movie from way back. Yeah. The David Soul TV miniseries. Version. Yeah. Right. Th this is a very hard question for me because Tim Curry is a damn national treasure. I'm a huge fan of his. I actually yeah. uh, would see him frequently at the Gelson's close to my house in L.A. You know, he's, he's in a wheelchair now, but he looks great. You know, he's, he's, he's got a guy that takes him in there. I'm just like, oh, my God, that's Tim Curry. Pretty amazing. But I'd have to say for me, uh, Salem's Lot was a diaper changer. I like, I still have <laughs> nightmares about that character, about Kurt Barlow with the, what makeup person, and did they invent it, decided to put the fangs in the front, in the middle. Like, that what? makes more sense. I just, it makes a lot more sense. Deal. Nosferatu y. It is, yeah, yeah. which is great. great. I love Nosferatu. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is very much. And I was too young when I saw that to realize it was probably a callback to Nosferatu now that I think about it. But when I was a kid, I hadn't seen or heard of Nosferatu. So it was just like, I still get like ugh, feelings when I think about that, how I felt when I saw Salem's, that Salem's Lot series. It freaked me out so bad. So, Forrest? Yeah. Uh, for different reasons. I mean, I, uh, and we talked about this before. I, it was just a couple of years ago that I actually uh, had the inkling uh, or the, the, the gumption to watch it, the original TV series with Tim Curry. And the clown is scary and it's weird because there's, there are two types of different monsters and they're scary for different reasons. Tim Curry was scary because he is spectral. It's not really a clown. It's kind of a spectral projection. Here comes the spoilers that Forrest cannot help but do whenever discussing anything. Yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I spoiled a, a movie from a movie series from 1979. I'm sorry. I know, but you're like I'm not going you're to, I'm explaining not going to, the whole story. I've already done this before, and you already gave me crap about it. All so right, well, uh, I'm going to do it. Again. Just, just get over it. Okay. So the the no the idea though is that it's <laughs> uh, it's a it's a mental projection or a spiritual projection from another monster which you don't really see, which has got its own thing going on. So, which seems to be more, much more primitive, but is psychically very advanced. So that's scary. Kurt Barlow, on the other hand, for just a vampire as a creature, just appearance wise, beats those two, uh, especially as a kid with the David Soul. That was such a great series um, with David Soul and, and James Mason as uh, his, Barlow's caretaker, Richard K. Straker. Yeah, the makeup is just frightening. It's very well done. I always thought as a kid, too, it's like, oh, that would be easier to punch a hole in the neck if you got the two fangs right up front, big, long, curly fangs, rather than the incisors. The friend, Lance Kerwin, Mark Petrie, floating in a, in a dreamlike state at the window, scratching, like, let me in. Yeah. It's just, yeah. So yeah. the whole thing, the gestalt of that, that was for, it, scary, but for different reasons. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. And now part three. If Carl Kolschak were alive today, now this <laughs> yeah. assumes that Carl Kolschak was a real person sure. and is no longer alive, but oh, that, that's great. I, that's how I think of Carl Kolschak. Yeah. Would he have a podcast or a YouTube channel? I'm, I'm going to jump in on this one. Go ahead. You go first. It seems like it's for you. <laughs> I, it feels like it was for me, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like he would absolutely have a podcast. We wouldn't know where it came from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't know how often it was going to drop. But when it was out there, you would have to listen. 
Yeah. Because yeah. the original, you know, the original concept of Kolshak was that he, in the TV movie, he was making these cassette tapes and he was mm -hmm. telling his story into a tape recorder, right. which is so evocative and so podcasty. So yeah, yeah that, I, that's what I would think. But what do you guys think? Didn't he work for the Seattle Post Intelligencer or a Seattle newspaper? Or where, where was his base? In the newspaper? second one, in the Night Strangler, he was in Seattle. In the first one, he worked in Las Vegas. And in the ah, television right. show, he worked in Chicago for a news service called the International News Service. So oh, it was the I, INS. I, I, I love that you know all this. <laughs> it, just, it really satisfies me. But I would say, uh, yes, there is a... When you look at the two types of mediums, you can do things that you can't do one with the other. So with Kolshak, uh, you know, occasionally he was there with his camera, right, trying to get a flash to be. It, it turned out blurry, and it's like or that thing chasing him in the mine with the lights that creeped me out. The mine lights popping out as he's being chased down these tunnels. Visually, you want to have a place to show that because, of course, audio. It's really hard to describe something spooky, and and you want to be able to show your visual evidence if you have it. And so, obviously, video is the best format for that. But there's something about audio that gets in your head much more than a video can. Visually, stuff you, as I always say, you can't unsee that, and it can creep you out. But there's something about uh, the spoken word that is much more immediate and on a different level. So I say he would have both. All right. Chelsea A. from Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, wants to know about your tape recorder, the Panasonic RRDR60. Mm -hmm. Where do you get it, and have you used it since the Sally House? We got it on eBay, or I did specifically. I mm -hmm. After we got back from Ohio from the small convention we went to there at, at, at Kent Stage in uh, Kent, Ohio, and we saw... Uh, some folks there that had one and heard about its reputation. When we got back, I went looking for one on eBay and it was incredible. How expensive. much was it? I feel like it was 12 or 1400 maybe. Yeah. Um, in the ballpark. Yeah. Which, um, no more than 1600, I think, but like you'll see ones that are kind of still in the package or very brand new going for like 3000. Yeah. I don't know if they sell for that, but yeah, that's what yeah, they're, they're, they're up there now. I mean, part of me would like to get another one. And then if it was producing the same kind of results, have it dissected. But that's an expensive proposition. So, uh, which I think <laughs> oh, I'm already take mentioned. it apart like the bet sphere. See, but then the magic yeah. goes away. Yeah, oh, then stop. the magic yeah. goes away. But uh, <laughs> so to answer that question, that's where we got it. We got it on eBay. They are up there from time to time. Ours is not for sale. Somebody emailed us last week asking us if we wanted to sell it, oh. and I would go with no. But I also not even for a million dollars. Um, yes, yes, for a million dollars. For a million dollars, yeah, you can have it. Give us a call. But it's also I don't have it. It's not with me anymore. Forrest keeps it, and I don't particularly, at least right now, I don't particularly like having it in the house that I'm in. Forrest was, keeps yeah. it right next to the bet sphere. I, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, well, that's the Noah Wiley show with Bob Newhart, the librarian, where it's, a, well, I guess it's Warehouse 13. It's not a new thing. Right. Or even uh, The Lost Room, Rich Adams' The Lost Room. A collection the or Lost a Room, you guys. Yep. yep. Anyone and, out there within the sound of my voice, watch The Lost Room and then let me know. And you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I very much enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, it's a tasty it's, series, but a, but a collection of uh, strange objects with mystical powers. The DR60, did it get any further use after uh, Sally House? I did. So we are going to present this one day. I want more scientific examination of this, specifically the audio, not so much the, the mechanics of it, because I don't really care about the electronic components. I mean, that would be cool if we got a, if somebody could take the specs on it, the blueprints, the schematics, and build one. And I'd love to know if it continued doing that. Or maybe it's like the story of the sausage factory where there's a beloved sausage, you know, was being made at this old, really old factory and everyone loved it. It had just the right, you know, the souciance uh, of flavors or whatever, however you say that. So they got a new factory going and same recipe, same machines, same process. The only thing that was really different was the building, was the layout. You know, they couldn't figure, it's like, yeah, it's not as good. It's good. It's just not as perfect as it was before. Like, what's going on? So they, they examined all their processes. They came to realize that in the old building, it was multi-floored. And so when the sausages, like after they were stuffed or whatever, and, and the machine spit them out into a cart, this old, uh, nearly retired guy would would wheel it down like three floors, you know, go through the the maze of the building and to get to where it's supposed to go. And there was something about the process of it getting the air 
in the whole building and that the time it took and just the exposure and, and all that, which was the only thing that was different. And they figured like, that's what's missing. It's like the, you know, people will say about the, the bagels in New Forrest York or the pizza. literally though. telling us how the sausage he's, gets made. That's what he's doing yeah. right now. He told us how the sausage was made. That there's and something not only different. that, so you, what makes it good? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's my point is that you can the rebuild old man the DR-60. The yeah. <laughs> That's what the story was. Hey, look, I had my sausage. And the, the point is that you could rebuild the, the DR60. They may not work the same. There might be something very specific to that. And I, yes, there's a lot of people that will, we're constantly getting articles, especially on our YouTube uh, uh, posting, which I, yeah, I'll take a look at. They're very interesting, but basically how like, well, there you go. This is the fault of, uh, of this recorder. And they do call it the DR60 barking. Or, and there's a term for it where it makes that noise similar to what you heard at Sally. So what happened is that last year, on my Midwest uh, adventure road trip with Jill and Roger Pingleton, we we went to a bunch of different locations. Waverly, went on to the Bourbon Trail. That was a ton of fun. Went to the Talbot Inn, which uh, uh, Scott would love because Jesse James stayed there, got drunk and shot holes in the wall. Very, very cool old place. So when I was in there, Jill had arranged for my room to be one that had, as its closet, an old refurbished Mosler safe. And I think at the time, I can't remember what the building was uh, used for, but it, it was an inn and kind of a way station. So uh, the safe in that it's concrete walls, I'm sure steel reinforced. There's two doors. There's a uh, one that swings open. It's maybe about a quarter inch to an eighth of an inch thick of steel. And then a heavier door that swings open on top of that with the combination. So I was inside that and I got some crazy recordings that are on the level of Sally House, but different in emotion tone and message, I will say. So I want more scientific uh, examination on from somebody who is in the field of something similar to audiologists uh, who can take sounds and see if there's really words in it. And kind of what reminded me of that was the, remember the whole, uh, where you'd hear um, two different words, people would hear different words uh, being the same phrase, depending on, on how they're, um, how their hearing makeup uh, is configured and that. Uh, Yanni versus Laurel. Yeah, that's it. Yanni or Laurel. And Somebody who can analyze that and maybe pick out words from that because I can hear a few words. And to me, the recording that I got at the Talbot Inn in the vault, which also for me rules out pretty much getting radio interference, there is a story being told there to me because I asked a question, you know, like, who are you? Uh, what's your story here? Is there anything you want to tell me? Like, what was your experience here? And I believe something or someone, most likely I believe it was, it was a, someone, a, a past person who lived and worked there was telling me their story or telling me an anecdote because there's words in there that I can make out. But like I said, before we reveal all that, I want it more analyzed because there's just too many questions that comes up. But yes, to answer the original question, I have been using it, continue to, and there's something to that particular recorder. It's wild. <laughs> it's just, it continues to get stuff and it's crazy. Natalie F. would like to know if you guys would be willing or open to hosting a show like Unsolved Mysteries or In Search Of, one of those kind of things. Would you guys be open to uh, cashing a giant paycheck for uh, a couple hours of work a week? <laughs> yeah, I would absolutely <laughs> do that. It would depend on the commitment. If it was just hosting it and it was kind of a low, a low lift in terms of time, uh, then that would be great. I, I wouldn't want anything to get in the way of continuing to do what we're doing already. And we're already trying to develop something for YouTube for next year. We're working on that now and, and being very um, deliberate about that. So that um, is fun. It's taken me this long to want to go back to dealing with video, honestly, because I edited, you know, for 17 years and I was sick of it. It was part of the reason I wanted to start the podcast. It's like, this is just audio. It'll be easy. I was wrong. But um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah no, well. that would be that would be fun. I would I would totally do that. And we've gotten a few calls for things similar to that, that where the, it either fell through or there, there was one where they wanted us to go to the Arctic Circle for like three months. And I was like, this does sound fun, but I can't. Can't quite <laughs> get away right now for that. Yeah, <laughs> that was a cool idea. So they, you know, they they come in, but you know, on the other hand, I don't can't imagine who would pay money to put my face on television. There is a freedom. Some would say too much freedom, but doing your own show, which is a, a, why podcasting is a a great medium and format. No one's controlling you because we're independent. So when you get into a TV show, there are a lot of controls, and and rightfully so. To a lot of degree, but yes, you you would be uh, hammered into the Don't the hole that is the television me, man. Exactly. 
All right, LC wants to know, because you guys do a lot of research and you read a lot of books. So if you were going to recommend to the listeners, what's at the very top of your everybody must read book list? God, I got to tell you, we have read so many great books and I made a list to answer this question, but I know there's one that I recently read and I can't place it right now. I have to like look on the, I mean, I have a closet with a bookshelf in it, which is really just a metal restaurant rack, but it's like top to bottom (laughs) books. There's so many good ones. And, you know, there's an astonishing literary group on Facebook that just formed on its own. They actually read stuff together, I think, in there. So you should check that out if you're on Facebook. But uh, we've read a lot of great ones. The ones that come to mind for me, like right off the top of my head, is Dead Mountain by Donnie Eicher about Dyatlov Pass, of course. And uh, then there was the Yeti book by Dr. Daniel Taylor, not only for the topic, but the way he approaches a scientific analysis of the legendary creature. It's really cool. He's one of my favorite authors that we've interviewed. Uh, Brandon Masulo's book, The Ghost Studies, I think is super fascinating. And also Rebel Gold on the Knights of the Golden Circle. That one has two titles too. I can't remember. Oh, Shadow of the Sentinel. It was published twice. Like once it was called Shadow of the Sentinel and the other time it was called Rebel Gold. And that's about the KGC. That one is super fascinating. There was a book that you you talked about that you really, really loved for the Roanoke episode. Oh yeah, Rich. I, I, that is the one I was trying to think of. That's The Secret Token. Myth, Obsession, and the Search for the Lost Colony of Roanoke. That book was just so well-written, just a really great read and super informative and interesting. Even if you take out the fact that it's about Roanoke, it's a really great read. So that's another one. That's by Andrew Lawler. So those are the, those are the ones at the top of, of my list of the books there. Forrest, what about you? There's a few books that I have been uh, meaning to get to for years and years now. And it's the series of uh, lectures and articles compiled Uh, by Dr. Alexander Cannon, uh, who's just an interesting figure, you could say. Uh, I'm not sure everybody would get into it. I mean, there is, it is pretty woo, but it's also uh, based on his experiences and uh, just a fascinating character. So that uh, one book, I I believe is called uh, The Powers That Be, and uh, his other major one is The Invisible Influence, but they're based on uh, a series of what's called the Mayfair Lectures that he made, I think, in the mid to late 30s. And it's about the nature of reality and existence and all that kind of stuff. So, okay. Well, here's one Julia G asks, which astonishing legend that you guys have covered do you think would have the most terrifying implication for humanity if it were proven to be fact? For me, I think it's probably Skinwalker Ranch. There's something going on with that place. Like, I came away with it thinking that. It might be a doorway and that these things that are coming through it, it might just be the environment that they live in and it's there and they pop through. It's just something they grew up with. It's not necessarily that they're controlling it. It's like when you're walking in the woods and you find a stick on the ground, you pick it up. They're walking in the woods, wherever they are, whatever ever other dimension, and they know that there's a portal that brings them into our world or something like that. I, You know, I don't know. That place, whatever's going on there is freaky and the deliberateness of some of the pranks that happen there, that just really freaks me out. The other story that I think is really scary, especially with regard to the specificity of that question, the implication, terrifying implication for humanity, is Terry Lovelace's story, which yeah. is a recent show. So yeah, that's my answer on those. I think Skinwalker Ranch, this phenomena seems to be happening in various places, as we said, Bridgewater. Yeah, Triangle. that's not the only place. Yeah. Um, it, you know, but it's it's somewhat localized. It does seem to fall people do report that it has followed them. <laughs> the strangeness, the high, the high strangeness, the the poltergeist activity. But it is fairly localized. Yeah, I think for global humanity type fear is that disclosure where the government says, Yeah, you know what? We um Aliens are real, and uh, we're all now hybrid experiments. So uh, that's the disclosure. Buckle up, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, you thought uh, coronavirus was bad. Uh, guess what? You're now going to be living in a glass tube full of pink glowing goo for the next year, and, and uh, we'll have two heads. I don't know. If you're like me and you have a child who's growing like a weed, you know my pain when it comes to shopping for clothes right now. You don't want to take them to the store to try new stuff because every size is different from brand to brand and you want to be responsible so all you can do is make a wish. Count to three and hope someone makes an online store just for you. And three... (laughs) 
two, one. Your wish is granted. Well, <laughs> as you've discovered, there is a company focused on making that happen, and it's called Stitch Fix. And you, my friend, can't stop talking about it since we signed up. I tell you what, before I even got my first order, I loved it. I loved the website. You see, this is how my mind works. I have never understood why do we have to guess if a medium is really a medium when shopping online. We're trying to be safe and go into the UPS store to return something just to get your money back is just another trip somewhere, right? <laughs> yes, I believe that's called vanity sizing. Well, along comes Stitch Fix, and it's for men, women, and children, and it's an awesome solution for anyone that likes looking good in quality stylish clothes and shoes, but either doesn't have the time to search for outfits themselves, or is curious about getting help from a professional stylist, or wouldn't know where to begin, like me. Stitch Fix says you fill out a quiz that nails down all of your tastes and styles and preferences, then has a stylist work with you on putting together outfits that actually fit and that you'd actually wear and look good in. And after I took their quiz, I was actually kind of excited to see what they'd pick for me, and then even more excited to open the box. And I gotta say, everything fit perfectly. It's clothes I'd love to have bought for myself if I knew where to look. And I think I look pretty decent in the combos if I do say so myself. But even if you didn't like a suggestion they send you, you just mail it back. Easy peasy. Everything about it is super customizable. It is too much fun. All you got to do is go to stitchfix.com slash AL. Set up your custom profile. Then Stitch Fix will deliver great looks, personalized styles just for you in your colors, styles, and within your budget. It's just a $20 styling fee for each fix. Which is credited towards anything you keep that you like and fits. There's no subscription required. Plus, shipping, returns, and exchanges are easy and free. Anyone can get started today at stitchfix.com slash AL. And you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash AL for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash AL. Technology has improved just about everything. Phones, cars, shopping. Yet, mattresses have, more or less, been the same since the invention of sleep. But we deserve better. And finally, the mattress has evolved thanks to Purple. I was so skeptical about all these trendy pillows and mattresses that everyone has told me I had to have. And I actually tried a few pillows, more than a few, which made me even more skeptical because most of them are great for about 30 minutes and then you can't get comfortable. I probably have three different memory foam style pillows in my closet and my purple surpasses all of them. So that's the one that's on my bed. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Well, to me, it's nothing like all those memory foam pillows. It's honestly the best pillow I've slept on. And when it comes to the Purple Mattress, you are not going to get a better night's sleep. It's soft where you need it, firm where you need it, yet it's very durable. It's not going to sink on you or lose its shape. The Purple Mattress is for everybody. I grew up in the South, and being cool throughout the night is a big deal for me. I can't sleep when I'm hot. I hate it when a mattress retains your body heat like a solar panel. Mm. You won't have that problem with the Purple Mattress. It has like 2,800 open air channels and naturally temperature neutral gel. You're going to stay comfortable. Well, I know what you mean, man. That's like an L.A. summer night for me. Look, here's where the rubber meets the road. Purple is so confident in what they do. They are so sure about your satisfaction that every Purple mattress comes with a risk-free 100-night trial. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, but I got to ship a mattress back? Wrong! Free shipping and return. So there you go. Experience the next evolution of sleep. Go to purple.com slash AL and use promo code AL. And hurry, because for a limited time, you'll get $150 off any Purple mattress order of $1,500 or more. That's purple.com slash AL and use promo code AL for $150 off any mattress order of $1,500 or more. Terms apply. Hello, everyone. I am Zelda. When I am not explaining to people that, yes, that is my real name and no, my parents were not gamers, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. It was my great grandmother's name. Let's get back to the show. Donna WK asks, are there any topics or specific legends you guys are interested in, but will never do an episode about and why? I think it never is a, is a big word, um, but we've, we've looked at and shied away from the entity for a long time. I'm What's very, that? yeah, I'm very interested in that story. There's actually, if you're not familiar with it, um, I'm sure there's a book on it, but there's also the movie that came out with uh, oh, Barbara right. Hershey so that you can watch. But it's a very disturbing story. 
but it's also fascinating. But it, there's a darkness to it that is um, a bit intense. It not, but that's not really the reason that we stay away from it. The reason we stay away from it is because in exploring the reality of it, some of the mundane explanations go to places that we're not likely to cover on our show, just because of the nature of the show being kind of a family show and that sort of thing. So that's one that we've stayed away from. If you if you watch the movie, you might get why. But it's fascinating because there was a, a point in that where they tried to, in the movie anyway, where they tried to capture whatever the thing was that was causing the problems. And it's really, it's a really neat film. Oh, but, thanks uh, for the spoiler. Um, yeah, that Great. is a spoiler, isn't it? Great. You're right. They captured it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't ever want to hear you accuse me of spoiling a film again from the okay. 70s. Okay. Okay. All right. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, you're right. I did spoil it. <laughs> I love it when they fight. <laughs> I just want you guys to be happy. It's not your fault, Rich. <laughs> That's what makes us happy, fighting. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, the... The Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. We yeah, actually have a fully, yeah. almost fully produced show on that, and we never released it because of some of the implications. Uh, it ha- has to do with uh, a relationship between a deceased person and a living person, and um, the victims' families are still around. And we felt like there was, uh, it might be disrespectful to implicate that a stranger to the, or not a stranger, but an acquaintance of those girls was being contacted by one of them when the family members may not be, for all we know. And so it didn't seem right to do a show where we're saying the ghost of this murder victim is interacting with someone. Because then if the family member hears it and it's like, well, why, why am I not hearing from that ghost? Uh, so we never ran it, but it's a fascinating story. Not only that, it's that uh, the person, we know this person fairly well. Uh, who is involved in the story. And I believe that it still affects them very deeply. So there's a lot of heavy emotion in there and, and, and rightfully so. And I'm sure this story has been covered by other true crime podcasts. Yeah. We're not really true crime people. Depending if you find it interesting, but we don't, uh, yeah, we don't go down that road. And usually we look for a, a mystical angle on it. So to the people that you know, request us to cover the stuff that is strictly true crime. We usually don't, but it just depends. Um, there's something interesting about it or it connects to interesting people. We, we might consider that, or uh, it, it turns out to the Velisca ax murder story, there was something larger going on. And that's another case where I think, you know, Scott will say, well, the house isn't very haunted, but I, I think it is maybe not to the level of uh, some other famous haunted houses, but there's definitely something there. And then something that compelled me to want to do that story. It's hard to explain, but yes, that probably is covered largely into a, uh, or folded into a true crime genre. But the, yeah, as far as the, um, there is a book on the case, if you want to know more about it, uh, called someone cry for the children written by Dick Wilkerson and Michael Wilkerson. And it covers the whole case. And there are really fascinating aspects of it that do dip into something supernatural that possibly could have been happening while it was going on aside from the angle that we would cover it on. So it's an interesting case, but yes, very too probably emotionally packed for us to do the unpacking on it. All right. Now we have a very urgent question from Krista H. Would you rather be in your vehicle surrounded by black-eyed kids, or be camping in a forest and actively stalked by Bigfoot? Black-eyed kids every day of the week, black-eyed kids. I'd rather be in the car. Yeah, because I'm not going to let them in. I'm going to have the doors (laughs) closed, the windows up. Bigfoot wants to get in the car. He's getting in the car. He's not getting in the car. And also just being stalked (laughs) by a a wild thing in the woods like is a thousand times that's bigger than you. And like, no, no, thank you. Black Eyed Kids. Let's look at the cases here. One, uh, like in Lyle Blackburn's book, Momo, it just wants your tuna fish sandwich. There's, it doesn't, it wants to rifle through your purse. As far uh, as you know, you don't know what it wants. Do you not remember when we had Chuck Zukowski on and he talked about the Bigfoot that bent the guy in half or bent the the girl in half backwards, I think, because she was screaming. But, uh, well, Look, th- that's classified as rogue that. Bigfoot, you know. Yeah, but so how do you know? You don't know which one you're going to meet. <laughs> you, 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 you're right. Hey, that guy pointed a gun at, uh, well, apparently, it, it, it snapped the gun in half and uh, stuffed the hunter into the tree. That's the other story that's yeah. kind of horrific. Uh, yeah. here, here's my here's my thinking on it. Uh, if you're going to believe in this kind of stuff, um, with the black-eyed kids, and maybe I'm cursing myself, I 
would maybe want to experience an encounter because as we mentioned at the top of the show, there is a feeling that goes with that, that right. ethereal deep down to your core, like this ain't good. These ain't regular, you know, skate punks. There's something that's that ineffable feeling that is only experienced in an encounter like that, which I, in where it's genuine. And so I'm curious about that. Not that I'm egging that on or inviting that in out to the universe. I'm not saying show up at my house, but that has fascinated me, that aspect of the experience. On the other hand, with them, of all the stories, there does seem to be a protective element in regards to protection, in that you have to invite them in. Every story we come across, they, they ask to come in, and uh, if you do, it's not great, but you can say no, and there's something about your space, so there are ways to protect yourself. Bigfoot, on the other hand, Rogue Sasquatch, well, it's, uh, if, you, if you think about it, it's a, it's a large human-esque, humanoid creature, very powerful, and if it wants to, it can mess with you, but generally, it doesn't mess with people unless you're messing with them. So in that regard, being stalked, it's not like, uh, I think I would try to communicate with it uh, <laughs> in, in some, and, and try to get some audio evidence of it, you know, but I'm not, I'm not going to, yeah, throw rocks or at it or, or try to provoke it. Yeah. And there's not a lot of stories of people being killed by Bigfoot. Not so too many. Occasionally, they, I, oh. they do come up. And that's before we, we interviewed Chuck Zukowski. And, and this might tie into a, a question coming up, but you know, that's something I wasn't really aware of. I know that people have been harassed and scared and maybe, you know, if they go out disappearing in the woods uh, or get disappeared in the woods, you don't know what happened to them. But generally that's not associated with Bigfoot stories, uh, violence. Bigfoot grabbed them and took them through the portal to some other world. <laughs> well, that's another thing that I, I, I consider is that there is a, maybe a connection to something, um, to ultra terrestrials and other dimensional aspects. Jason H. asks, what was your most dauntingly researched episode? Mm. I don't know if, you, it's, if it's daunting for fear or workload. I'd say for workload, it was probably Oak Island, also Mothman, mm. Earhart, Patterson-Gimlin film. Those were all up there on workload. For fear, I would say <laughs> uh, Skinwalker Ranch, The Sludge Entity, Shadow People, stuff like that, Black Eyed Kids. That stuff was scary. My perspective is a little different in that uh, it's not so much the, the research was tough. It's, I've oft, I often complain to Scott about this or we'll get on and just commiserate and I got a vent. Sometimes you're just, it's not the subject, but we're just not in a mood to dive in and like crack that book open and start looking at articles and, and start the outline. And so- uh, The mojo can go away from you sometimes. Yeah. Which is I'm usually modulus. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> well, because part of this feels like you're always in high school. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 is my friend Tracy, who is a uh uh longtime friend. I've known him since uh, high school, I believe. And we were uh, he's a couple of grades ahead of me, or was for a couple of years we were roommates and and so he would see my process. He's sitting, we're in a room that's got two beds in it. He's just seeing me like doing everything else except for studying or writing that report. He's like he would say, like, I know your your shoes are going to be shined this week because you got several reports coming up and you're going to do everything else. It's like, yeah, I know. I just can't get into it, man. And and then finally, at that last moment, I'm cramming. So a really bad habit, kids, to start in your school days because it can follow you. Or maybe that's just the way I'm made up. But anyway, to finish uh, Tracy's thing, he's, he's like, so you chose a job here, a career where essentially it's a lot of book reports. <laughs> 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 After you decided to do and I, I yeah. guess so. I mean, it's not always like that. And like we explained earlier, we have a division of labor. We'll tackle different aspects of a story. But, you know, sometimes Scott and I'll start texting. It's like, man, I just, I can't get started. I can't get into this. Yeah, thing. the times that we're really in deep dookie is when we're both in that zone of not being able to get started. Right. And the record day is the like the next day or the day after. <laughs> and we've well, done nothing. Yeah. And then, the, so then that's when I usually text Sarah and I say, would it be bad if we didn't get this to you until the day before it's supposed to post? At which point she's like, yeah. I'm booked that day, but yeah. fine. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about, what about a third of the show? What if we would just record yeah. maybe, maybe some of the commercials and, and the, the, the cold open. It's just like, okay, just as soon as you can, just, just <laughs> as soon as just let's just call up Rich can. and see if he wants to have drinks and talk for an <laughs> yeah. hour. And that'll yeah. Be the yeah. Episode. yeah. Exactly. That's right. You rescued us. But here's, here's, 
here's a here's a life tip, folks. If anything, uh, if you're asking me if I've learned anything, is that uh, generally what happens is that you have to get started. And sometimes you'll stare at that blank, uh, you know, Google Doc outline. Nothing's happening, but you just got to get into it. And then usually, a lot of times, what happens is like Scott and I. It'll be that yeah, the next recording date is just like it'll be. 10 30 p.m. and I'll text Scott like, man, I'm I'm really into this. this is, <laughs> I've, I've got the mojo. I'm flowing here. The, the info is really interesting. I'm finding great connections. I'm making a lot of notes. And he's like, yeah, we, and we got to start recording tomorrow at 11. So <laughs> it's like, <laughs> now is not the time to be doing. I should have been doing that the uh, four or five days earlier. Yeah. But and sometimes that moment hits in the middle of the recording session. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you get you. Okay, you'll find your, I think I'm. I it. think I've got this now. I think I've got yeah. it. That's that's great. We have 20 um, minutes left. You know, but, but and sometimes yeah. it happens after the episode has aired. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ideas that come up. It's like, man, we I forgot to talk about that. Dang it, you know. And but but really, it's you just gotta m- start mucking through the weeds and get into it and and get uh, slathered all over yourself and start the process and and it still might be slow but what you'll find is that you'll you'll pick up some momentum but if you don't crack that book if you don't start then nothing's going to happen gee so is this the wrong time to ask the question from river are you guys ever going <laughs> to write a book oh river our uh, one of our our good long time uh social media yes uh, i would i would even pals, go so yes. far as to call her a friend um <laughs> <laughs> she's an editor. She's wanting, she's pushing us to, yeah. we've actually been, uh, there was one other uh, editor a few years ago who said, when are you going to, if you want to write that book on the rules? Um, oh, yeah, um, well that is okay. So I'll, I'll just quickly mention this. We, well, the rules I, of podcasting or no, here's, uh, it, it's, it's fallen by the wayside now, but it's sort of like, well, Forrest had rules about how you never get stabbed by a ghost kind of thing. And like, <laughs> not completely. Oh, Here, right. Here's, yeah, the, yeah, here's yeah. the, here's the deal. Okay. So uh, a lot of people, because I've been, uh, bla- you know, shoot my mouth off about, uh, the connections and the, uh, what I see is, uh, some things that don't seem to happen that could, but they don't like Bigfoot is won't that- kill you unless it's a rogue Bigfoot. <laughs> 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 there are terms and conditions and they will apply. <laughs> the idea is that, uh, you, yeah, you don't often hear of a poltergeist like yeah, ramming a, you know, a fireplace poker through someone's midsection. There are things that don't seem to happen, although everything around it, uh, fire starting, people being scratched, there seem to be limits to that. And then having talked about that over the course of the shows we've done, uh, people said like, well, that seems like a, a set of rules there. It's like, well, I guess they are. I'm not sure how they work. And I'm certainly, here's the deal. I'm not an authority on it. So I feel, um, I would feel like a sham trying to put this together and say like, here's the, you know, force 39 rules of poltergeist and spirit uh, uh, interactivity. We could put together certainly something of our observations and that would be fun. But here is how I would do it. I thought, and I ran it by Scott and he, a couple of years ago, and he thought it was a good idea, <laughs> is that we have a an Astonishing Legends almanac. and I mean almanac in like a fun compendium of all stories, uh, some of those rules, puzzles, <laughs> weather forecasts, everything that's kind of fortune and fun in an almanac fashion, much like the farmer's almanac, poor Richards. Uh, yeah. yeah. Again, we're not on a level of Ben Franklin, but, but a compendium of just like weird fun stuff that we find interesting in some kind of format and maybe every year, a couple of years, you know, well. Not with illustrations. Big and, yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, every just year. A, just, but here's, yeah. can I throw something in here? Sure. Forrest is an amazing writer. He's a much oh, better writer than I am. I tend to focus on structure more than the eloquence of the writing or whatever. It, here's something that, I don't know if people know this or not, but like I write all the cold opens. All the Forrest reads them, I write them. The other thing that Forrest always writes is the description paragraph for the show. And I would encourage everyone to read that. I think some people probably don't look at those because they're up on the web page for the yeah. show and it describes, it's an overview and he's writing it after we finished the show. So it's got a very good overview to it. And we pop it into the description, you know, but we're not sure what podcast aggregators, I don't think you can always see it or it doesn't turn up or you're not going to look on your iPhone at it or it might get truncated, but it's out there. Those are really, really good but what I will also say about those is that it takes Forrest five <laughs> or six hours to get that paragraph to me sometimes. <laughs> um, so if well, we start a yes. book, I don't know, like. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, first of all, thank you so much, my good friend. Uh, yeah, that's sure. really, really kind and generous and, and sweet of you to say. 
on the other hand, I was trying to distance myself from those because there will be somebody who is in the uh, literary. It's like, yeah, let me take a look at those. Oh, this is crap. No, oh. I love them. I love the paragraphs. So, really uh, well, that's just, we, again, that's part of the division of, uh, of labor. But here's what's different. And Rich, as a screenwriter and, and general writer and, and man of letters, can weigh in on. The writing is different. So I'm always really impressed when Scott does the cold open. He's like, uh, I'll talk to him like an hour and a half. And I was hoping to have a sandwich and maybe a, a quick nap. He's like, yeah, cold open's done. Okay, we're ready to move on. It's like, <laughs> wow, uh, you summed up that really complex historical, like overarching 400 years of Irish history. You summed that up. It's like, yeah. And I said, yeah, I had to call it. It was hard. I had to call it from a bunch of different sources, but I I, I checked to make sure they were right and and uh, fact checked it and pulled in some other interesting facts people wouldn't know about. I'm like, wow. Uh, but the writing is different. Writing that is different. And I would say, um, okay, Scott, it's like when you do a 30 second you edit a commercial or as I had experience editing a, uh, a trailer and there's certainly different styles, but you're boiling a big thing down into 30 yeah. seconds, one minute. And it, they're all different. It's like, it's when you edit a, a movie trailer, that's two minutes, 20 seconds. And you have to find the best clips and tell the story without giving too much away. It has to be a very special format. And, and usually very, it's a very specialized editing editor that can do that well. Uh, and it's not as easy as people think. It, what happens, unfortunately, with the business is that you have all these puzzle pieces that get boiled down, boiled down. You, you talk to the the studio or the network, and then it's just it, the first two passes are creative. And then it's just endlessly rearranging everything. It's like, let's try this. And after 30 revisions, it usually ends up looking like the first one. <laughs> and that's just dealing with networks, which we don't want to do in, in a television type medium. So, but what I was going to say is different. It's like when Scott writes that, it's like, I'm really impressed that he's got all that down and tells a little bit about the story because we realize it takes, it may, we're bearing the lead sometimes, or it takes a long time to get the story. So we want to tell you what it is up front. And that's the reason of the cold open. Like, here's the gist of the story. Yeah. We here's didn't always why. have you that. might find it. It was a late yeah. development. Yeah. Clearly we are unable to stop burying the lead. We just can't well, <laughs> do it. So I've decided Look, we're going to put the thing right at the top. <laughs> Yeah, so well, I don't want any more emails about how it took us 20 minutes to get to the thing. So we're going right. to write at the beginning, you get the overview. Yeah. People have to think about it this way. It's like, okay, so we have two hours. So we're just going to do a one-off. And it's a big topic. Like, uh, I try to think of something historical. So maybe it is like Loftus Hall, okay? And you have a certain amount of time. You can't tell everything in that. But if you do it linearly, maybe Loftus Hall is the, the best example, but... That place has had a lot of history of bloodshed. And to really understand it, you should back up to when it was first built and understand like that's seen a lot of turmoil, uh, human misery. And so where the the devil appears in the story is maybe three fourths of the way down. Now, if you shrunk that down to an hour of storytelling, it's like, well, then, uh, yeah, OK, 40 minutes in, then you're going to hear the, the juicy part. So we try to encapsulate it. So let me ask you, Rich again, going back to the Twilight Zone, is that uh, all most of the episodes are 30 minutes, except for season four, which you said were, they tried an hour-long format. Right. But you didn't think it was as good. It should be 30 minutes, in your opinion. And when you go to write something, those are really big uh, markers. 30-minute show, hour show. Uh, you used to call them like 30-minute people and hour people, <laughs> the different writers who, who do that. What, what's the difference to you and, and how that works? You know, you declare your form and then people get used to experiencing your content in that form. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was the problem with the Twilight Zone is that it worked so well as a half hour that expanding it to an hour didn't make it twice as good. In a way, it made mm -hmm. it half as good because it felt what had been very tight uh, and efficient storytelling suddenly felt slack. Now, I'm not saying those episodes were slack, but they could very easily be seen that way because suddenly it was now taking an hour to do what you were doing in half an hour. Conversely, if they were hour-long episodes that suddenly became half hours, they would feel rushed. So yeah. you guys have sort of declared your territory where you, you t I think you tend to go a little longer. It's like, well, yeah. you know, why do something in one hour when we could do it in 11? <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. But, but the people who are addicted to your show are addicted because of that, because mm -hmm. they're, they're not tuning in to get, there's some podcasts that are 15 minutes. We're going to tell right. you how a light bulb works. Great. Right. 15 minutes, we're out. You got the info, boom. This mm -hmm. is more like, we're going to really take a deep dive and, and it's going to be two guys who enjoy digging into stuff, talking to each other. Maybe there's a guest or an interview. You sort of get used to that. And then, and then when there's a one-off episode, it's like, wait, what? 
You're only doing one. <laughs> yeah. Why should I even bother? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll yeah, make I get your that. next six parter, you know, and then yeah. uh, we'll, we'll rejoin the show then. So I, yeah. I, I think there's, there's a lot of expectation rolled into all of this. I get it. I get it. Conversely though, it's like if you folks out there don't like the multi-parters, you can come back and, and uh, you can jump off. You don't have to eat the whole meal. Well, I mean, of course. I mean, this, that's the other thing about, you know, people's complaints about the podcast. Look, there's a lot of podcasts and you can come in and come out and listen. I mean, again, like a lot of interview podcasts where it's just every episode, the, you know, it's like Mark Marin. He's talking to a different celebrity. If you're into that celebrity that week, you listen. If you're not, you don't. And right. you don't need to complain to him about it because for <laughs> everyone you don't like, someone else loves hearing. It's like, I, maybe I'm not into the music people, but there are other yeah. people, that's all they want to hear. So anyway. The, listen yeah. to this email. This came in two days ago. Hey guys, recently found your podcast and have listened to around 10. I can't help but think of your podcast as the audio version of a History Channel show. And that's not a compliment. I listened to the entire <laughs> Edgar Casey on Atlantis <laughs> episode and it was all about anything except the title. It was five to 10 minutes of Casey on Atlantis and then History Channel backfill. The Voynich manuscript, you did a hundred possibilities, then said none were possible. I get it. You have to make money. Listening to you for hours, then having you contradict your own points as a twist is just annoying. Whatever. You're popular and happy. Keep blowing smoke and cashing checks. What? What? <laughs> that was a nice one, right? <laughs> I wrote this guy back. I said, will do. Thanks for the feedback. There's 750,000 podcasts on the iTunes directory now, so I'm sure you can find one more suited to your tastes. I might recommend lore. <laughs> oh yeah yeah well there, there you go i'm it's always taking a, the high uh, road by the way wait with, with the trolls we don't have a lot but that tries. was that was the meanest yeah. one we've okay, had in a scott, while <laughs> scott seriously though to be honest i was drunk when i wrote that so <laughs> <laughs> wow, he signed up for a, a, a VPN service just so he could uh, make it seem like the email came from uh, Canada. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay, well, speaking yeah. speak of that, and, and this is kind of interesting, it, it sort of touches on that question in a way, and I'd never thought about this, but I would love to hear what your opinion is, and this is our final question, but... Mm -hmm. Can't believe it. It comes from uh, Mike in the Ark. He's like, it seems to me that entertainment producers, meaning other shows, may be taking your lead for paranormal topics. In other words, are you noticing on TV shows that you cover a topic and then pretty soon they're covering it, same topic, maybe even in the same way? And how does it make you feel? Guys, is there any... Uh, you think there's truth to this? Yeah, I think there absolutely is truth to it. Wow. And really? when I go back to, um, I mean, Rich, you've been in TV forever. I mean, you must have seen this happen to you before. I remember when my wife was in the Growlings, which is an improv theater in LA, like uh, Second City is in Chicago. And they were doing shows. She was performing there and writing sketches there for five years. And you would see sketches from the group that she was in and other groups because they had different groups performing every week. You would see stuff, ideas and jokes taken from those would turn up in sitcoms. Usually the, the next season, sometimes the same season, really specific jokes, really specific ones. And there's just no question that some writers or producers were coming to the Groundling shows and then, uh, you know, scribbling down, oh, this is funny, I'm going to use this on the next episode of Seinfeld or whatever, you know, like that's not the best example. But there, that was definitely happening. So I kind of expect that to happen. I have seen it happen with our show more with podcasts than television, but some with TV. Their spins. <laughs> but I don't, it doesn't make me mad. I think it just happens. No one's going to do what we do because we we talk too long and we go too deep. Like, God help you. You want to do that? Good luck. You want to do what yeah. we're doing? Go for it. I well, just, there's like, your answer to the uh, the, the emailer. Uh, how did you get that? Uh, was that on iTunes? No, that was an email sent to us. No, I that came into with our uh, astonishing contact at gmail.com. But uh, uh, yeah. when, when? A couple of days ago? Two days ago. Yeah. I think well, I answered well, it in the go. middle of the night, but I, I okay. like it. just like, okay, great. Thanks for that. That's a, well, that's a wonderful, <laughs> that's that, that's a real pick me up email. Why are you even bothering to send that? Just don't listen to the freaking show. Yeah. I, <laughs> look, it, to, to that point, it reminds me of the old joke, uh, uh, the, the person uh, complaining to the waiter, like, uh, you know, the, the food here is terrible and the portions are small. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's just, yeah, you don't have to eat the whole plot. You know, 10 episodes, you suffer through that. Like, dude, quit on the first one. It's, yeah. it's halfway through. <laughs> Talking about what's, what Scott is speaking of is that that's our style. And so no one else dares to drone on and on and on and on about it like we do. We don't try to do that every time. We don't have to stick with that. I think what the guiding principle is, and I've said this before, is that we we want to say everything we want to say about a subject. 
with also keeping in mind that there are some things that we do leave out because it's like we we do, you know, look, our background is editors. We trim stuff away. That's kind of our nature to get to what matters most. And so, but in, in light of that, we also get to say our fill. And that is the luxury and also the indulgence of, of having a podcast. I, regarding the genre, I think, you know, there's thousands of stories out there, thousands of strange things that, that can be covered. But most shows are going to hit those at some point. You're going to cover the same things. Now, I could say honestly that Scott and I, we don't, uh, we don't mine other playlists or series titles to look for episodes. And sometimes that happens out of coincidence. You'll see another show, uh, Mike Brown of the Pleasing Terrors podcast. When we did Resurrection Mary, he had covered it a week before. And I, and I was listening to it. It's like, wow, a lot of great, uh, a lot of great storytelling in here. We reached out to him and said, hey, do you mind if we mention you on the show? And and say that we got pulled some facts from your show. He's like, yeah, it's fine, cool. So there's a good yeah, and we've been asked that, that several happens. times, and we always say yes. I'm going to say it. I don't say it on the air, but I'm just going to say yeah. it was just way too far out of a coincidence that Henry Plummer wound up on lore <laughs> for me. And I don't have anything against Aaron Mankey at all, and I think yeah. his show is awesome, and it's a different take on it. But I was just like, Henry Plummer? Like, Forrest <laughs> had to, like, break my arm off to get me to even consider to do Henry. I was like, there's nothing paranormal about this. And then, yeah. you know, I wound up being glad that we did it. But then it's like it popped up on lore, and I'm like, how would you pick Henry Plummer a vigilant, you know, a sheriff and the vigilante movement and all that. I, I was just like, okay, all right, <laughs> okay. Well, it but. may. That's the thing is that he may have he may have his own. Uh, well, I, I'm sure he has assistance. Yeah. And well, he's they're making they're coming ten through billion dollars. You know, he's got Netflix. Yeah. Talk shows about cashing them checks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talk about that. We do well enough that I don't have to get another job now. It's you know, and I can do this solely. But it's not much better than the last job I had, so it keeps and me to occupied get to see me every fed. day. Yeah, <laughs> which I, I enjoy. That's the thing, you know. I I I enjoy that immensely. So it's not like oh, the millions of dollars you're making. It's like that's come on. And, and people that they don't know how showbiz works. It's not. No, well, that's what Amy it. Poehler always used to say at Saturday Night Live. I love it. She would she would say, "You'd be surprised how much money we're not making." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you guys that from the point of view of a listener and sometimes guest, but now speaking as a listener, mm -hmm. it, it's always fun to come across something that I've never heard of, the Kara object being one of them. Yeah, yeah. And so that's that's fascinating. But you know, what's great about what you guys do and the and the kinds of stories you tell is that the joy of hearing a new one isn't really all that much more than the joy of discovering you're going to talk about something that I love reading about and thinking mm. about and have been pondering my entire life. So you know, these topics in a certain way never get old. And that's why there's so many shows covering them and everyone does it in their own way. That's the point. Yeah. The beautiful thing about Astonishing Legends is that the stories at their core are so fascinating and the mysteries are so open-ended that the fun part is the speculation. And when two people like you guys who clearly have affection for each other and have known each other a long time and have so much fun digging in and really relishing the mystery of the topics that you cover. It never gets old and you guys could be doing it for the next 50 years and I'll still be downloading. That's going to wrap up our series on fear and smoking in Blanket Fortiana. We'll be back next week with a very special new show. Please remember to support our sponsors. They help keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Jackie Shepard. R-Y-A-N. It was my great-grandmother's name. And my name is spelled. We are the Shepard sister twins. L-A-Z-E-D. S. L I M. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell and co produced by Tess Feifel, who is also our head of research. Our theme, which is available as a ringtone, was composed by Judson Crane, and our sound design and additional composing is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the Astonishing Research Corps. But most importantly, we want to thank you, our listeners. Visit our store at astonishinglegends.com or interact with us and other listeners on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also support the show at patreon.com slash astonishinglegends, where patrons have access to additional bonus content. 
No part of this show may be reproduced anywhere without permission. Copyright Astonishing Legends Productions. Good night.